Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Tuesday evening webinar. My name is Mary Jo Williams. I'm the Network Training Coordinator for the Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center, and I will be your facilitator and moderator for today's session. And today's session is called Patent, Trademark, Trade Secret, and Copyright Basics. We are privileged this evening to have with us as our presenter, um, Mr. Douglas Lineberry. He is a partner at a law firm out of Greenville, South Carolina. Doug specializes in technical, sorry, Doug specializes in intellectual property practice group with representation including patent, trademark, and copyright protection. He assists clients with protecting intellectual property through patent, um, lost my spot there, through patent, trademark, and copyright prosecution, as well as intellectual property litigation. Doug has experienced drafting and successfully prosecuting patent applications for various fields, including mechanical, medical, and chemical technologies. He helps clients with establishing and protecting trademark portfolios, guarding same against improper third party use and conducting enforcement actions. His practice areas include litigating intellectual property issues, drafting and prosecuting patents in the chemical, pharmaceutical, medical and gaming fields, rendering opinions and validity analyses, obtaining and defending trademark registrations, as well as advising clients with regard to intellectual property trade secrets, branding and marketing issues, along with contractual and other business matters. Now, Doug Lineberry is definitely the person that we wanna have as our presenter for this evening, and he's encouraging a robust conversation. So please put your questions in the chat and we will rock and roll with Mr. Douglas Lineberry. Mr. Lineberry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary Jo, that was too kind. Um, everybody, I'd really, really, really encourage questions. Uh, you can chat them, you can yell them at us. We're all informal here. Uh, as long as Zoom's working, we'll communicate. I will let you in on the little evil secret. I can see all of your names. So if you guys don't ask questions, I'll ask you questions. So I figured it'd probably be better if you asked your own. I see Steve up there laughing, Ted too. You guys are victims as well. If I can see your name, y'all are in for it. Michael's now got a panic look on his face like, I think this guy's serious. But y'all, what I want us to leave with tonight is an understanding of basically all four major tenets of intellectual property. But if you guys have specific questions, please ask. I'm happy to go over any question you've got. That's why we're here. Y'all got me as long as you need. You're not being charged for this, so please take advantage. We'll start tonight by going over the do's and don'ts of trademark and copyright protection. Um, one thing I'd like to ask is, does anybody on the uh, chat have a trademark? You know, feel free to hit that one up. I won't pick on you for it. I'm just curious if anybody has uh, applied for one or thought about it. And I'll kind of keep an eye on that. And Mary Jo, if anybody else, if y'all see them pop up and I can't see them on my screen, just let me know. But one thing I'll tell everybody here, guys, is that if you have a company, you have a trademark. It's axiomatic. Because if you have a company, you have a name, you have a brand, you have a slogan, you've got a logo. There's some way that your customers recognize you. You know, that's why you went to the SBDC to begin with. And full disclosure, I'm on the state board in South Carolina, so I love the SBDC. They're a great organization. If any of you on this are not currently working with them, I really strongly impress upon you to do so. Uh, they're great, they're free, they're state sponsored. They always do good work. I can tell from just a, a brief interaction I've had with Mary Jo, she's the kind of person you wanna bring questions to. But what I also want you guys to know is that all of you have this IP. You might not have all four types of it. I promise you, you've got at least two or three of them. Um, one thing I want you to realize, though, is that this importance of trademarking is like a brand. You know, guess what? You guys in the Virgin Islands, on the States, we all know McDonald's. We all know Coke. We all know Nike. That's the power of branding. It really doesn't matter where you're on the planet. Some brands are so powerful that they breach any all social, language, cultural bar barriers. They're simply known. And understand that's how these businesses relate to their customers. It's how they're viewed. If you've got a website, though, guys, you've got a copyright. Um, if you create original materials, guess what? You've got copyrights. A lot of people fail to understand that copyrights are very robust protection. It's everything from jewelry to art 
uh, designing website, graphic displays, writing code, making statues, making movies, making music. All of those are protected by copyright. So I promise you guys, at a minimum, everybody here tonight has a trademark. You have at least one copyright that you've done, and you also have trade secrets. What trade secrets are, are basically the value that you have over your competitors. You know, for instance, like Michael or Beresford or Eugenia, this would be how you commoditize your work ethic, your knowledge, everything you do to gain a leg up on your competitors. You know, the little corners that you cut to be more efficient. You know, your suppliers to give you a good price. You guys all have these three at a minimum. Some of you probably do have patent protecting material. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I want us to do now is to realize that, hey, if anybody does have a trademark, you know, I'm not seeing the chat. And again, I will promise you, I'm not the most technically savvy individual. So if someone has been brave enough to chat and I haven't seen it yet, I will try to find it. But what I do want y'all to know is that if you have a name, we want to make certain we search it. And one thing I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you guys how to search. What I want you to be able to do is to leave here by saying, hey, you know, that'll do this library did show me a couple of things. And one thing I want us to go to is I want us to go to the um, USPTO. Um, you guys feel free to sing along, as they say. But where we're at right now is simply USPTO.gov. You know, nothing special about it. Typed in this address, went to it. Um, again, everybody just head nods. Can you guys see the PTO screen? Yes. Okay. I'm getting some head nods, awesome. Okay, so the way to check your marks is to do this. Go to trademark, click on it. You'll go to test, you know, name of a pretty woman, but also the name of a pretty search engine. Click on it and then go to basic word mark search. Now, Michael, I'm gonna put you on the spot. What is the name of your company? And feel free to unmute and yell it if that's easier. Uh, yes. Say it one more time, Michael. I got some static. Oh, core finance. Can you hear me now? Core, I can. Thank you. Let's do a check on this. And again, uh, Q. Uh, awesome. No, you just Q. So cute. Yep. Yeah. Am I typing it right, Michael? Yes, you are. You're good. Awesome. Now, one thing I do like is the misspelling here. You see that? And obviously, it's intentional. But to Michael, that is a good way to get brand recognition because, you know, one thing human beings recognize is patterns and breaks and patterns. So, Michael, I'm going to tell you, it's very cool to hit it out that way. We're going to do just a, a search right now. You'll notice we're looking at live and dead. We're only interested in live trademarks from a protection standard, but we're going to search both just to see what's out there. Boom. All right, Michael, it might be lottery night. Hold on. Meaning that core finance is clear. We'll do that again because it's really quick. We help submit the query. What we found right now is that there is not an exact match for Michael's mark. Now, remember, though, Michael did something cool, and he spelled it a funky way. For us to do a better search, if we were to file Q-O-R-E at the USPTO and there are any C-O-R-E's, they'll be raised against Michael's mark. So let's see what we see now. Got a couple here. Now, again, Michael, looking like a good night to play the lottery. So if you've got favorite numbers, we may be in the loop. We'll see that we have three of them pop up. Two are dead. You know, we jump on Finance Core here. Looks like it was filed back in 2001. You'll see that the thing canceled in 2008. Most of the reason these cancel, and you'll see this one registered in 2002. I will bet y'all dollars to donuts. They did not pay the fee for this one. That happens to a lot of trademarks. So Finance Core, and again, that would have been the juxtaposition of yours. Now, um, Michael, if you would, unmute again real quick and give me sort of the thumbnail sketch of your business. What do you do? Hey, thanks, man. And good evening. I forgot to say that before. Um, oh, so welcome to <laughs> So we're actually in the process of developing a financial application. Awesome. Um, so we provide more than just that. We provide financial learning, financial scheduling, and a bunch of different financial services. But at its core, it's really just an application. I love it. Now, Michael, what you've done is set out some very important distinguishers between you and these guys. Because look, for Finance Core, they do loan origination for medical equipment. So Michael, that's good. You know, you're going to have an app. You're going to have financing. But guess what? You're probably not going to have a loan origination for medical equipment. That might be one of your customers, but we would protect you in a much broader stance. Now, remember, this one's dead. So Finance Core doesn't mean a thing to us other than it's a good way to do a thorough clearance search. Because let's say we did find a Q-O-R-E finance. Lo and behold, it was in Trinidad and Bodega. Lo and behold, it's in California. Lo and behold, it was somewhere. If we did see one, we would want to check them out and see what they're like. 
Now, right now, Michael, you're looking golden, my friend. And thank you for letting me use your mark, by the way. But oh, worries. I'm curious to see if just the Q-O-R-E would be. Ah, I like what you're thinking. And we'll jump out and we'll go to that in two seconds. See, guys, this is what I want. Michael's getting the game. I want y'all to do this. You're not bothering me. This is awesome. This is how we learn. When we look at this core food, uh, core four skills, food, fitness, finance, and friendship, this is what I call a run on mark. These guys didn't actually know what they were. So they're kind of four score skills or food, their fitness, their finances, or friendships. Um, good for them. Also good for Michael, because guess what? They're educational services. We're going to go down through here and look at it. Guys, you can always cheat and do a control F if we're just going to look for finance. You'll notice the only time that finance pops up in this is actually in the name. It is nowhere in any of their sets. Indeed, their physical fitness, you know, conflict resolution, more educational services, workshops. So, Michael, none of these marks would be a hindrance to you. But Michael raised a good point. He said, hey, what if I just want to be Q-O-R-E? Maybe that's going to be my McDonald's. Maybe that's my Nike. So let's check it out. Now, this one, too, I'm going to keep it live and dead. And if I could type, I'd be so dangerous, guys. But thank you for bearing with me. One thing I'll tell you all to do on your searches, you'll notice I put in an asterisk right there. That makes it a very broad search. It will look for cores. It will look for core possessive. It will look for corest, coring, blah, blah, blah. So this would be a good way to figure out which marks are out there. So let's see how Michael's doing on the grand tour. Awesome. We've got some cores. Now let's go back and narrow it down a little bit. Let's go back and look at the live cores. And looking at these, we're down to 23 marks. And everybody's like, still, that's a lot of marks. But what I would suggest you guys do is click on each one and see what's in them. You know, here's one for information technology consulting. You'll notice, Michael, that one's a, a stylized Q with the core behind it. Uh, looks like these guys are out of Alexandria, Virginia. And so, obviously, Michael's more focused on the finance section, which is awesome. We're just going to kind of do a quick search on these to see if we find other folks that are doing things like a core for finance. Now, here's one. Providing financial services, services, financial services, yada, yada, investment portfolios and budgeting. And you'll notice this one is a U, I guess that's a U, with a core below. It looks like it should have been a stylized Q to me, but what do I know? So, yeah, well, that's funny enough. That's, that's me. That is you. That is awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I so, started the process, but I've been having some issues uh, with it. No, that's okay. So let's check and see where you're at. Michael, I'm going to dig into your laundry. Is that Okay. This is a public record, so anybody can do it anyway, but are you okay if I click on? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Let's see what the file history looks like. So right now, and again, all I did, let's back up so I'm showing you guys. You find a mark you like. You're going to go up here to TSDR to find out about it. We'll click on that one. We're going to go over to Documents. Now, ha, so what's going on is Michael just had an office action uh, issued last month, June 12th. Michael, you've got six months to respond to this. So always put that down. Huge calendar notice. By December 12th, you guys need to have a response on file to the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, cool. Um, Michael, file this one as you spaced. And Michael, I'm just going to pull up your specimen so you can see, everybody can see what you're doing here. But you'll notice he used his web page as his indicator of, hey, here I am. Y'all bear with me. I'm trying to exit but not lose everything. Cool. Now let's go to the office action. And so, guys, one thing that Michael's done is he's already filed for his protection. You'll see they call it UCOR. And, Michael, is that intended to be a U or is that a Q, that stylized element? I don't know why it's a U. Like, I've been wondering for a while. I, I, um, you, you can it, and after I came back, it was, I saw you. I don't know Yeah, why. you can amend it. That, that's not a thing. It's just it looked odd. And with you being core, I'm like, okay. But that's not a big thing. You can amend that U to a Q that shouldn't cause any actions. Oh, so Michael, you had a previous action. So now here we go, guys. And they've kind of done our dirty work for us. You'll notice that what they've done for Michael is they have pulled up various core marks and said, hey, here's some core marks that are similar to us. And I bet they would have been on our list if we kept going down. Notice what they did right here, though, guys. The phonetic similarity of C-O-R-E to Q-O-R-E, just what we were talking about earlier. That's why we did the search for core to see what's out there. And you'll notice these are financial administration of retirement plans. Both of them are. Uh, you'll notice that there's also another core. And these numbers right here, the reg numbers, meaning that they've registered. Um, you'll go over this on your mutual funds, distribution and investment, hedge fund brokerage, distribution and investment services. 
Notice these are all C-O-R-E, C-O-R-E, C-O-R-E. Now we do have this original core analytics that we're looking at. This one's providing financial information analysis in the field of investments. And so at this time, it sounds like probably what y'all did, Michael, was did you guys argue against these marks? You basically went back to the trademark office and said, hey, you're incorrect about this or we're dissimilar to these marks for various reasons. Did y'all try that? Yeah, I think we tried it once. Yep. And right here's the response to it. And you'll notice that we'll pull this up, Core Innovation out of St. Thomas. See, I'm trying to find the actual thing. And guys, we're not doing anything inappropriate here. When we have a communication with the trademark office, everything that's submitted is a public record. All of you can follow along on your computer to do this. Michael, you can do it on yours. But let's go down and see. Oh, yeah. Looks like you guys fought a pretty good one here. I'm going down to. Ah, now this was a smart move. You know, their attorney said, hey, we're not liking how broad we are. We may try to narrow this to get back away from some of those C-O-R-E marks. I've done that for clients, too. It's a good way to be able to distance yourself from another mark. I'm going down to see if we can find out where Niall filed his response. I just wanted to see what his actual response was. Here we go. Response to office action, JK. Okay, these are files that he used. But ultimately, what's going on now is that Michael and his attorney are having a little TAT with the trademark office. And, you know, Michael, it's probably aggravating for you, and I sympathize, but it's good to know this now, because if the PTO is unwilling to give you this mark, one thing that I would suggest is that we look at divesting from it. And even if you did get it, I would caution you that we are under, you know, I, I don't want to spook you on this, and I don't mean it to go that way. But what I will tell people is to be very cautious. If there is a mark out there that is like your mark, I would encourage you to really be suspect about using it. And by that, I mean, like in Michael's case, we've got some other marks that are out there because we've done a trademark search and we found these others. And, you know, obviously Michael and his attorney now found them as well. But what we want to do is if these other cores are out there, you know, Michael, if they give bad advice, do you think most people are going to try to figure out if it's Michael Gerald's core or this other core, or are they just going to ignore all cores eventually? Yeah, more than likely they'll ignore it based on their That's right. And yeah. I've told that to people actually this week. I had a guy call yesterday with a mark. We looked it up. He's in the food preparation industry. He wanted to go buy uh, Bodega Estalia. And we looked at that, or Australia, sorry, um, Street Bodega. And so he looked at that one. We found one in Colorado that was a Street Bodega, literally uh, translated out in English as Street Bodega. And to him, you know, I'm going to tell him what I told Michael, you know, sometimes a Michael talk to your attorney about this, but you know, if you're thinking the USPTO is going to push back too much on this, use that as a cautionary tale, because guess what? If there are a lot of marks like yours, and I love the way you went the core on that one, the only worry about that one being Michael, just like the PTO did, they'll bring up a C-O-R-E against you, but I like how you're thinking. And I also like that stylized Q element. Because what you may want to do is the ultimate drop back to just use the stylized Q as your mark. Then you would have to only worry about C-U-E, Q-U-E, yada, yada. But the cores are all now reversed from the picture. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, actually. That can be a way to go back to the drawing board. But in this case, you know, what we've got, sorry, guys, I didn't put this all the way up. You know, we've got some confusingly similar marks. You know, we saw that in um, Michael's, and again, Michael, thank you so much for letting me look at that. I found over the years, it's amazing how these flow with us and help educate others by it, but thank you very much for letting us do it. But right now, the trademark office says, hey, we've got some confusingly similar names here. We've got like a host of them. So in this case, you know, Michael and all his attorney are fighting back to the PTO and saying, hey, you know, we don't agree with you. Here's reasons we're different, yada, yada. But what I would say is this, if the PTO is going to abide by that and they're going to say, hey, we're not going to give you a mark. First of all, appeals are not very successful. You know, they're very ginned up so that the trademark office wins these, the examiners win these. So what I want you to do is think of, hey, maybe I'm going to go back and do something different. Like Michael's now thinking, hey, maybe I use my stylized Q as my mark. Because guess what? Q is not core, either with a K or I'm sorry, a Q-O-R-E or a C-O-R-E. It's an entirely different mark. Now, one thing, Michael, let me pitch back on the spot. And you're going to be my straw man because you're doing this so well. Did you design the specialized Q or did somebody do that for you? Uh, I work with my designer. Awesome. Um, Michael, one thing I want you to do, do you have an assignment from that design, from the designer to Michael Gerald? 
Say that one more time. Did you get the designer to assign the ownership, the copyright, all the IP in that stylized queue? Oh, yeah. Good. I'm glad you did. Because um, a lot of people come up with this, they'll come to me for a trademark and have a very cool logo, but they have a graphic designer who assigned it for them, guys. And the problem with that is, you know, we're talking about trademarks and copyrights. So when Michael went to the designer, when the designer comes up with that stylized cue, they have a copyright in that cue. So let's just rewind that. Michael went to a graphic designer, said, hey, I want a stylized cue for my company core. The designer says, cool, I'll come up with one. And they did. It's a very cool looking one. Uh, so cool indeed that somebody thought it was a U and not a Q. But if we do not have an assignment from that artist to Michael, we have a problem because the graphic artist has a copyright in that. Even though it's a single letter, the graphic artist is the copyright owner until they assign it to Michael. And that's why I asked about that assignment. If he didn't have that assignment, I literally would be sending him one once he gives me his email because we would want that taken care of post haste. We don't so want someone with a company name who has someone else owning the logo. Uh, here in South Carolina, it was a kennel of all things that caused the problem. Um, I'm in Greenville. If you guys are familiar with South Carolina, um, South Carolina is shaped like a diamond. I'm over in the left of it, up toward the point of the diamond, uh, about an hour from Charlotte, hour and a half from Atlanta. But we had a dog kennel up here that used a cool little Bichon uh, Spaniel as its um, emblem. That was its logo. It was this very cool dog. It won all this uh, KFC awards, and maybe it's an AKC award, whatever it was. But they won all these awards. Very pretty animal. Went to a graphic artist, but they were not as smart as Michael. They did not get an assignment. So they used this logo for their website. They used it on cars. They used it on billboards. They used it on TV, blah, blah, blah. The designer came back in a couple of years and said, hey, you know, it's all well and good that you guys like my dog picture, but you owe me a royalty for every single use. Michael is out of that issue because he had that graphic designer assigned to him. Unfortunately, the kennel people did not. Um, they basically told the uh, artist pound sand. Artist said, no, I'm going to court. So they sued him here in Greenville County in federal court. And the judge came back and said, hey, you're absolutely right. The kennel owner did pay for uh, that logo but they only paid for one use of it. The graphic artist did not assign the copyright. So they were entitled to a royalty for every use of it. It actually sank that kennel, guys. So understand this from a business perspective, from a just universal protect yourself perspective. If you have a logo that you didn't create yourself, you need an assignment of the copyright. And I'll say that one again, I talk real fast. So if I slow down, that means there's trouble. We need, if anyone here has a logo that they did not assign, we need an assignment from the artist to your company. If you do not have that, use me as your straw man. Say, you know, Mary Jo introduced me to this madman from the continent. He says that I have to have an assignment to be able to make this work because you do. If you don't, the graphic artist or your brother, your sister, mother, father, whomever it was who designed it, best friend, ex-wife, whatever the case may be, they own the copyright. Meaning that if I had a business and they owned my copyright, every time I used it, that's copyright infringement, guys. And you'll notice I put that right here in the center of the list. You don't own it. If we don't have that assignment, even if you're using it with your business, even if you paid $1,000 for the graphic designer to do it, without that assignment, you do not own it. So Michael, again, let me... I'm, Absolutely. I'm gonna, let me, sorry, let me interrupt you real quick there. So I'm probably not as smart as 99% of the people on this, but can you explain to me in layman's terms what an assignment is and how do you actually get one? Absolutely. First of all, get one from an attorney and an assignment literally tabs like a two page document. It's not the Magna Carta. It's not a telephone book. And it states that me artist in this case, well, who, who's my next victim? Lori Christian. Lori Christian is our graphic designer. She designed a, um, a picture of a sunset going down over the islands for Tasha Cornell. Tasha's got a business that is a, what is Tasha? Tasha is a software program. And she's going to use that cool logo on all of her stuff. And all this thing says, Ted, is that I, Lori, assign all of my rights, whether they're in copyright, trademark, trade dress, whatever it might be, to Tasha. Do not, guys, pull that off the internet. Do not, do not, do not. Uh, assignments have to be written in current tense language. They can't provide things that haven't been provided yet. 
They can't assign things that the uh, copyright person doesn't own. Uh, we do want an assurance in there that, hey, if Lori assigns it to Tasha, that nobody else has an ownership in it, that Deanne or Joy or Chad aren't saying, hey, wait, wait, that's my sunset going down over the islands. That's not Tasha's. So we need to be very careful with that. But Ted, an easy way to get that is just to use me as the sucker I am and say, hey, Doug, can I have an assignment that everybody can use? And I'll be happy to send y'all one. Again, couple page document. It'll be a Word doc. You can fill it out. But if you don't have one of these guys and somebody else designed your logo for you or your slogan or whatever it may be, you don't own it. So Ted, that is an awesome question. Very simple document that transfers all ownership from that copyright author, i.e. the person who designed it, to the person who bought it, whether that's Erica or Tasha or Debbie or Celia, whomever it may be. Now guys, to show you all how easy it is to create a trademark, even if I can't see your camera, everybody pick up your cell phone real quick. Go ahead and open up your camera app. Awesome. Look at Steve and Ted playing on. Michael, grab that cell phone, man. You've been my star pupil so far. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Open up your camera app, gang. Point it at something. I don't care what. I'm just pointing it out the window. Push the button. Everybody, Omar, Teresa, Marshall, Yvette, all of you, by pushing that button, thank you, Michael, you guys have created a copyright in that photograph. That's how easy this is. That's what your artist created when they did your logo. Granted, it took a little more effort than pushing a button, but we all, all of us on this program tonight, just created a copyright with that photograph. Now, we're going to ignore, you know, Ted was taking a picture of President Obama, so there's some personality issues there, right of publication issues. Steve took a picture of Aerosmith, so, you know, there's issues there. We're going to ignore all that. We're going to assume that whatever we took a picture of, we're fine and dandy to take a picture of it. So all of us have generated a copyright. Now, what I want us to all realize is that for our graphic designer, when they made your logo, they created one the same way. And that's why Ted asked about the assignment. We need an assignment from that artist to your company so that they own it. Any questions on that, guys? I know I talk fast, so I'll stop and give everybody a second to ask what they may be thinking. I have a question. Joy uh, Havens has a question. Go ahead, Joy. Oh, unmute yourself, please. Well, we'll come back on my yes. Hi. Um, so we have online some of those companies like LegalZoom. Yep. So, so that's not, um, it's not savvy or smart to use them for uh, corporate documents like an assignment. You know, Joy, it sounds a little bit specious for an attorney to say use an attorney. Absolutely use an attorney. A couple reasons. Um, if you have LegalZoom or any of these groups like here, let me show you a little nasty trick these guys play up. Remember how all of us went to the copyright office, just or sorry, the trademark office a second ago and looked at Michael's uh, mark. We're going to go back. Okay. Anyway, if I can find it, because here is the guys that we're working with. These cats, Joy, are, if I can find anything that even resembles my website page. Here we go. These guys, Joy, are just unscrupulous. Uh, there's no better way to put it. Watch what happens when I go here and go to home. Boom. We'll see the New York Post try to pop up. We'll kill that. I'm going to misspell USPTO. Not page block. The reason this page is blocked is because it goes to LegalZoom or to one of these other entities who are trying to take advantage of us typing in the wrong thing. Um, that is just the beginning of how squirrely these cats are. One bad thing, Joy, you know, I told Michael at the beginning of this is that, you know, his office action has a six-month deadline. LegalZoom files the mark for you and essentially kicks you out the door. You're not going to hear back from them. If they do file anything for you, you'll be lucky if it gets anything done. So you guys find somebody in the VI, find somebody in the States, wherever you want them to be from, but find an attorney to use. I know that sounds self-serving, but Joey, one thing we do for you is we create a docket. You know, like with Michael's mark, when it was out there, you know, I'll ping Michael and say, hey, Michael, I'm getting ready to do a response. Here's what we're going to do. You know, Michael can say to me, hey, Doug, that's not a U, it's a Q. We need to amend the mark that way. You want a flow of communication, Joy? You do yes. not get that with LegalZoom. They are bad. And again, thank them for being so nasty as to try to misspell the USPTO.com because that's how these guys trick people into coming to them. Somebody thinks they're going to the PTO, all of a sudden they're on LegalZoom, and all of a sudden they're doing a trademark with them. Don't do uh, it. And with respect to the contracts, you know, obviously all of us are under U.S. law but there may be variations of it between any of the states, any of the territories. It is a good thing that if you're doing contracts for your business, that you have a VI attorney look at them and say, hey, 
You know, I need to make certain that you're copacetic because if I sent you a South Carolina document to use in the islands, it may not work. If I try to use an islands document in South Carolina, it may not work. Right. The attorneys in that area will be able to tell you, hey, Joy, yeah, this might work in the continent, but it doesn't work here. Here's what we changed. That's the benefit of having that. The legal Zoom guys, Joy, will just send you some piece of crap or they pull it off Google and then they will bill you for it much more than an attorney ever would. I mean, guys, I could bore you all to death with stories of people walking in with a five or six thousand dollar bill paid to legal Zoom and have nothing but a three ring binder of packs. Wow. That's all they got for them. And Joe, this joy, this happens all the time. So I want wow. y'all to be aware of that. Omar, I saw you click a hand, my friend. What's going on? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, um, does the artist or um, the graphic designer have the right to charge you for their assignment? Ah, oh, Omar, I love these questions. Omar, you're now my favorite pupil. Sorry, Michael. So I do think that you should do this because guess what? I bet some of y'all tonight, Omar, what's your business, by the way? What do you do? I'm with Elevate We and we just got our, we just got registered today. Awesome. Uh, what's your, uh, what do you guys do for business? What do you do? All right, so we are a nonprofit organization, awesome. and we yeah we do um holistic um living, and wow. we're actually we've partnered with VI Crawl to um, develop the theater space at Tillet Gardens. Fantastic, I love it. So in your case, I love why you're asking this because I promise you we have at least one photographer on tonight's uh, show, and we'll call it a show at this point because we're going into game show land. But what I want y'all to realize is Omar asked a million dollar question. He's like, can I monetize as that graphic artist, as that person who took a photo of a wedding, as that person who designed jewelry for somebody? Can I monetize that copyright? You absolutely can. You know, anybody here who's married, you're like me or Steve or Ted, the guys have been around the block a couple of times. We all know that if the wife wants those wedding photos, we either paid the big and got the copyright at the time of the pictures or we have to continually go back to the photographer because they kept the copyright. And that's exactly what Omar asked was, hey, can that person make some money off of that? Absolutely, they can. I would encourage you to. Because if you're a copyright artist, heck, it's your bread and butter, man. That's how you make your living is you generate your art and then you sell it to people. And if you want to sell the copyright, by all means, you know, provide an assignment with them. But make certain that they do pay you for it and don't give it away. Kind of the ba baby with the bathwater stuff. Obviously, on our end of it, if you're the business person, you know, you want to haggle. You know, one thing that I, maybe we'll come back and do this in the future, I do a presentation on haggling, negotiating, bargaining. Americans are no good at it. Most Westerners are no good at it. We need to get better at it because you guys as entrepreneurs, every penny counts. And I love the way Omar's thinking is, hey, if I can quantify this and I can get an income stream off of it, good for us. But whereas what the ant's thinking is, hey, I've got expenses, I've got a budget, I've got employees to pay, I want to keep those expenses as low as I can. One way to do that is to hack, negotiate, bargain, guys. Don't be afraid to do it. Just because it's written down doesn't mean it can't be amended. Um, a couple other warnings for trademarks, guys, is don't wait too long. You know, Michael went ahead and filed his. That's awesome. You know, they're having a fight with the trademark office on it right now to see what's going to happen with that. But what we do want to do is to go ahead and file. When you're ready for it, you know, let's do that clearance search first. We see any bumps in the road. We'll come back and address it and decide whether to file. But we don't want to doubt it because trademarks are filed daily, guys. Hundreds of thousands are filed in a year. Um, they're a massive amount of information. But we don't want to drag our feet because with these new ones being filed, you know, we might be a KORE and all of a sudden Michael gets a special Q and then QORE and maybe we're out of the game because we waited too long. Um, one thing too, Guys, any of y'all tonight, I know you've all got trademarks. I know you've all got copyrights. I know you've all got trade secrets. I want your trade secrets to be marked. By that, I mean I want a little superscript TM. If Michael gets his registered, he'll be able to put a circle R on it, but not until it's registered. For now, anybody in here has a mark, like Omar, like the new one for the nonprofit y'all got, for your logo, your taglines, or however you identify yourselves, put a superscript TM, Thomas Matthew, behind your marks whether it's a word mark or whether it's a logo mark, to show that you consider it a trademark. It keeps the honest thieves away, and it also helps to build common law rights in those marks. Now, copyright mistakes, guys, you'll notice I'm going to ha hammer, hammer, hammer on this assignment thing. If anybody here has someone working for them to do logos, to do software, to create a website, to take pictures for them, a host of information, guys, creating audio files, creating video files, we need 
those assignments. Remember, Ted asked us, he said, hey, what's an assignment? An assignment is where the author, and remember, an author is a very broad, broad term in copyright. It can be a metal worker. It can be a computer artist. It can be someone uh, recording videos. It can be somebody sculpting jewelry for you. But we want that artist to assign it to your company. We never want to make something remain with that graphic designer. And nothing against them. It's just that we need your companies. And again, I'll do a little SBDC footnote here. If you guys are on there and like Deanne or Celia or Debbie or Teresa or Kay, if you don't have a corporate entity set up, you need to get one set up. If you're out doing business or you're getting ready to do business, you have you a corporate entity of some type set up. LLC, you know, if there's something in the islands that works different for y'all, but probably an LLC, get something set up, make certain that you have that corporate protection in place, make certain that that corporate protection owns the trademarks, the patents, the copyrights, everything like that should be to the company. I don't want anyone personally liable for being in business. Now, you bet, think of it this way, if you're a hairdresser, somebody rolls in tomorrow and things go wrong and all of a sudden they go from having luscious locks to no hair, they might get mad at you and they might come at you and sue. You would rather that they sue the LLC than to sue Yvette something personal. What we want to do is to make certain that that corporate protection is in place. We want it to be the bulwark between you and everything that might happen in the business world. Uh, with respect to our copyrights, guys, we don't want to lift anything off the internet. We don't lift legal documents. We don't lift pictures. We don't lift songs. We don't lift photos. We don't lift anything, guys. It's all copyright infringement. Unless you made it or unless you have someone's written permission to use it, do not put it in your materials. Don't put it in your pamphlets. Don't put it on your website. Don't put it in your flyers. Don't use it in your television ads. If you do that, it will be a bad thing. Um, little horror story here. One of my clients is a manufacturer down in Columbia. In South Carolina is a diamond. Columbia is right in the center. Um, one of their research engineers came up with this um, YouTube video that they thought would be a good way to market this device for us. And they sent it to me. Their general counsel sent it up with a ha 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 at the top. Guys, he had taken snippets from about 10 different movies to put them together to advertise this product. That's 10 different instances of copyright infringement. And again, it, it's an engineer. I see Steve kind of chuckling and Ted too. You know, these things happen to everybody, guys. This engineer is a very smart guy. He's very good at making what he makes, but we don't want him doing the marketing for us. And I don't want any of you guys making the mistake of, hey, it's on the internet, I can take it. That's one of the worst booby traps in history. Do not do it. It's about as bad as using legal Zoom, Joy. Just stay away from that. If you didn't create it, or if you don't have permission to use it, written permission, don't use it. Um, also, guess what, guys? If you've got like, if you took the ultimate uh, photograph of the islands, like, you know, one thing, Mary Jo has this beautiful backdrop, um, shows the campus, it shows the ocean out behind it. It's beautiful. But if that is going to be like, let's say Mary Jo took that photo, and everybody loves that photo, what she would do is to register the copyright on it. Because granted, we all picked up the phone earlier and took a picture. All of you own that copyright right now. You don't have to formalize it in any way, shape, or form. But if Mary Jo takes that picture that she took of the campus with the sea behind it and registers it, it kicks it up a notch. You know, it literally takes it to the next level. You can get attorney's fees and triple damages. You can use it to basically prevent infringing uh, photographs or infringing art from coming in. There are a lot of advantages you get for registering that copyright, and it's a $65 fee. And at some point in the future, guys, we'll do an SBDC program on how to register your copyrights. It literally is just a checklist of, hey, if you can fill out your name and if you can submit something and upload 65 bucks, you can do a copyright. I've trained people to do this all the time, especially folks who are authors and create a lot of product because you don't want to have to go to an attorney every hour for your new copyright. It's best if you guys are trained to do that yourselves. So if you're a night owl and you're working at 3 a.m., boom, you take this great picture. You're like, hey, I'm just going to register my copyright now. I don't need a Doug. I don't need somebody from a firm to do it. I've done it myself. Um, also, guys, written agreements, anybody that works for you, I don't care if it's your mom, I don't care if it's your kids, I don't care if it's your best friend from when you were a toddler, you have a written agreement with those people. And I'm not saying people aren't trustworthy, I'm just saying that memories fade, time erodes. Somebody will have a conversation, two people can have a conversation, a year later they will tell you different versions of that conversation, not because anybody's trying to fib or make stuff up, we just remember things differently. Time passes, memory erodes. 
I want you guys to use writings, written agreements for all of your authors, written agreements for your employees, have them in writing, have it so that there is a concrete black and white example of what was expected from whom when. Um, guys, I cannot tell you how dangerous copyright is. We actually had a, a politician here in South Carolina get pinged for using a photo a couple of years ago. And I know we're all laughing, ha, a politician got it. It was a pretty innocent mistake. He had had a high school intern working on a uh, article they were going to put up about putting metal detectors in schools. And this was a couple of years ago after one of the uh, shootings that occurred. And one of the lower um, counties, you know, again, South Carolina's dumb, and one of them toward the lower portion of the point said, hey, we're going to put in metal detectors in some of our schools. We want to show people what a metal detector looks like. So they're not freaked out when they walk in and see this. They literally took a picture off the Internet, put it in their um, and literally just a flyer sent out to this guy's constituency, you know, not millions of people, probably hundreds of people at best. Kid you not, within two months of sending that out, they got a cease and desist letter and a demand for $5,000. So I want you guys to be very careful of what you take from the Internet. My preference is that you create your own stuff. If you don't, get a license. Because if you got a license, then it doesn't matter if you use that picture of metal detectors. But if you don't have a license, you get a demand for $5,000, and then I have to start haggling with a nasty attorney from New York over who's going to pay what and how they're so full of crap that it's not funny. You don't want that. It's easily avoided by either not taking stuff or having written permission to use it. So that is one thing tonight is always, 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 if you didn't create it, you better have a writing someplace showing that it's okay for it to be on your website. Gang, I'm going to stop again. I realize I talk fast. What questions do y'all have? Doug, I have a quick question. So there are some <clears throat> internet sites that you're allowed to purchase um, photos, purchase uh, diagrams, purchase various things. Um, yep. Are those safe to use? And when you purchase those, are those usually for a one-time use or you, can you continue to use it? Perfect question, Ted. That is a great question. So guys, Ted's saying, hey, we go to like one of these photostock.com or one of these other uh, sites to use their stuff on a website. Perfectly fine to do it as long as we read that agreement because Ted brought up some really good points. They may just say, hey, you can only use this on a website. So if we go and put it on a paper flyer, guess what? We've now violated it. That's copyright infringement. I know it sounds crazy, y'all, but copyright is deceptively dangerous. It is an extremely broad protection. Think of it this way. Copyright is so powerful that it is now pushed out to the life of us long-lived human beings, plus 70 years just for an individual author, plus 95 years for co-author works or works made for hire, guys. The reason is, anytime the Disney movies or some of the old MGM stuff come up, they go lobby our little politicians who are more than happy to take their money, and then they get the statute pushed back again. So bring it home, as Tad would say, make it simple. Protection for a poem is more powerful than protection for a fusion reactor. Just let that sink in a little bit. Protection for a cartoon is more powerful and lasts much, much longer than the protection for a device that may provide free solar energy to people. That is how powerful copyrights are. That's why I don't want you guys trifling with this. But if you do use one of those sites, read the agreement. Do what the agreement says you can. If you need to buy a bigger agreement or a broader agreement to do more, I'm certain they'll work with you on that. But make certain you're using it for those reasons. You know, here's a war story. I was at a cocktail party about five or six years ago, and I had a client give me their car. And it's this very cool rising phoenix coming out of flames. And this guy was a um, fire marshal who was actually helping to create corporate documents for various uh, fire marshal entities around the Carolinas here. Apparently, we've got oceans of them. And this guy was pretty good at it, and so he found this logo. I go to another party that week, and I don't party that much. It was just it was weird that this happened. And I get a, a real estate agent who sends me the thing. They were the fire agency, F-Y-R-E, you know, kind of like Michael had a cool misspelling on it. But it was the exact same phoenix rising from those ashes. So I got into work the next day, scanned that, sent it to my client, said, hey, I met somebody at a party last night who's a realtor using your bird. What is this? And just like Ted had said, my guys had gone to the website and had pulled down usage of that for a business card. They weren't the only person who did it. So did that realtor. They both were given equal and opposite rights to those birds. Kind of like I was telling Michael earlier, 
if there are too many people similar to you, and God forbid they have the exact same logo, don't use that logo. Because if she's a bad realtor, or if you give bad fire advice and stuff burns down, you are going to conflict with each other. You're going to harm each other. And Lord forbid you're both in the same industry. If you're both realtors, there might be a good realtor with that logo and a bad realtor with that logo. Kind of like Michael and I discussed earlier, nobody's going to stop to think, is this the good bird or the bad bird? They're going to give everybody the bird. Um, again, back to it though, guys, fair use and work made for hire. These are atrociously deceptive concepts, also in the copyright neighborhood. Fair use is basically for editorial purposes. You know, Daryl here is our journalist. He's going to go and write an article on something and he, he's given certain permissions or Debbie as a teacher is given certain permissions to be able to use works to educate, to get across messages, to compare. What we're not allowed to do is to use other people's stuff to make money. A good example is everybody knows who Harry Potter is. Let's we'll decide that uh, Stedman is going to open up a restaurant. He's going to call it the Hogwarts Express because he loves that damn movie. He's going to have, uh, I can't remember the name of the beer. Uh, Steve, what was the name of the beer they drank in uh, Harry Potter? All right, Steve says no. Right, who wants brownie points? What was the name of the beer they drank in Harry Potter? It just came back to me, so I can catch you if you're lying. Hogsmeade. Oh, Hogsmeade was the bar, Chad. What was the name of it? All right, Butterbeer. I'm going to distract us with Harry Potter trivia. Butterbeer. So what he wants to do is he's going to open up the Hogwarts Express and sell Butterbeer. Problem. Because he's now using indicia that are known to fit in the Harry Potter world. He's also using them to sell beer. So a bunch of issues here, especially if you happen to be J.K. Rowling or her attorney legions, is that maybe they don't want people selling beer associated with the kids' food. Maybe they don't want you using their names, and God forbid we decided to also lift pictures out of the movies for the website where they're all in that bar drinking butterbeer. What we don't want to do is we don't want to touch other people's stuff, guys. If we don't have permission to use it, don't use it, because you can't use fair use to get out of that. If you're doing it for a profit motive, and if it may damage the market for these other folks, and especially if you take a lot of it or an important portion of it, fair use is done. You're in trouble. Same made for work for hire. I kind of like the idea of, hey, I hired a graphic designer. I paid them money. Obviously, I own that logo. You only own that one logo because, as we were talking about earlier with Omar, that graphic designer, if they're savvy, they want to be able to make a profit stream out of that. They want to be able to monetize their work. So when we use a graphic artist or a software person or a website designer or a videographer or a photographer, whomever may be creating something for us, we want to have an assignment from them to you. Work made for hire only works for employees. And that's why it's such an atrocious name. Work made for hire or work for hire seems to indicate, I pay you, you work for me, I get it. That's the furthest from the truth. If your employees are working for you in the scope of their employment, it may flow up to your company. But let's say the janitor starts designing the website. The janitor's job duties are not the designed website. So even though it's your employee, you would still want an assignment from that janitor. If you don't have that, guys, we're leaving those copyright rights dangling out there, and they can come back to bite us, and we don't want that to happen. Again, uh, there's a there's a question uh, in the chat. It's absolutely. asking about stock photos or images um, that that are supposedly free. Okay, huge trick. Um, I, I just don't trust free guys because as soon as you trust free, you know what's going to happen. I had a client. I can actually tell this one's name. Uh, Manual Woodworkers and Weavers in North Carolina. They're about 50 minutes from Greenville up in the mountains. Beautiful place if y'all haven't been. Um, they lifted a poem off the internet. And believe it or not, it said it was anonymous. So, you know, everybody kind of equates that with free. They went out and made 72,000 dish towels. I'm not making a story up. 72,000 dish towels. Well, the copyright, the person who owned the copyright in that poem who had registered it was kind enough to mail us that registration and one of those dish towels. Very convenient. And then we had to figure out, oh, crap, we just made 73,000 infringing articles. And then we had to work out a settlement with that person because we infringed. And Ted, whomever asked that question, that's a great one. But guys, you get what you pay for. And I don't care if it says free. That would be an awesome way for somebody to take stuff from one website, move it to another and say, you can have my free photos with the copyright owners from that original site coming to get you because you're now using it at your business, at your website, as part of your branding or whatever. Guys, don't trust free. 
you either have written permission to do it or you created it yourself. And you just have that in hand because free off of a website can be like a picture of a metal detector, guys. They literally just picked it up, put it on the little article. Who would have thunk it? But they got a cease and desist letter for $5,000. Free does not necessarily mean scot free, and it might just mean trouble. No, um, I, got, I did have that. Uh, yeah, I at, at one time was known to utter the phrase free can be too expensive. I agree. Steve, that's brilliant. I, it is so smart because yeah. if, if you fall for that, guys, and again, it's a clever trap, and you're thinking, well, maybe they won't catch me, but some of these very nefarious, I, I use the word troll, not lovingly. Copyright trolls are folks who go out and sue all the time. That's actually the person who had our uh, picture of the metal detector. They have robots on the internet, i.e. software programs, that will track down their photos, and they'll find where they're used, and they'll find how they were used and when they were first used. It's not a matter of if, but when. And like Steve said, free can be very, very expensive. Don't fall for free, guys. Make it yourself or have a written document saying you've got permission to use it. Doug, there's um, a question from Ms. Havens. Uh, hey, Ms. Ms. Havens, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. And, uh, uh, sorry about that. Unmute yes. yourself and ask a, ask a question about domains. Okay, thank you. So on GoDaddy, sometimes you can buy domain names for websites, or yep. sometimes you can do a search to see if your website um, is free, like your name. So a, a lot of times I've stopped using it because I've seen that if I put a name in, it seems like someone is trying to knock off the name. So do you ever worry that when you go to the U.S. Um, Library of Congress and put a search that someone will try to knock off your, your name that you're putting together, or is that only for those type of sites like don't uh, GoDaddy and those other types of internet sites? Joy, that is a brilliant question. And you've answered you know, the answer. You know, when you go to GoDaddy and search it, that shows interest in the mark. And they're kind of doing what Omar said. They're quantifying based on that information. They want to monetize that screen. Joy Havens jumped on here and asked about this, said it was $5. Wait, let's jump it up. Now it's 50. You know, let's jump it up. It's 100. She checked four times. She's really interested in this. Um, what I would suggest to you, and the trademark office, the copyright office, those places are fine to search on it. If you want to go another layer on it, Joy, jump on Bing, go incognito. Jump on DuckDuckGo. It doesn't let anything trace you down. Oh, you, good. Yeah, you can use those. I'm a big fan of DuckDuckGo. You will notice, like tonight, if y'all don't want to use it, pop it on and go to, I don't know, go to a news site. Go to CNN, go to Fox, go to BBC, go someplace. You will notice in the top uh, left-hand portion of that screen, it will show you the various entities it's blocking that are trying to track you down. So if you are doing something like that, Joy, if you're in the exploratory stages of a name, definitely don't go looking for domain names. If you're going to buy it, buy it outright and see if it's available and just take it and you get that done fast, don't do queries. But again, like we talked about earlier, do a trademark search first. Make certain it's clear because, you know, like Michael right now is having to fight all these C-O-R-E marks, even though mm -hmm. Q-O-R-E was free. The trademark office says, I hear you, but they sound identical to the human ear. And they really do. Core, core. I can't even make them pronounce differently. Is that so, sort of like the group Rolls Royce and the car Rolls Royce? Kind of exactly. like that. Yeah. Exactly. And so and that's one thing, too, is that, you know, if you try to mimic one of these big brands, Joy, they may get upset. You know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But if you've got a brand, you know, like back to the Harry Potter thing, they probably don't want you showing a bunch of little kids drinking beer. You know, there are a lot of brands that will go out to enforce it to prevent naked licensing, meaning they're not taken care of and somebody else can use it. Ted, did we have another one? I saw your screen light up. Yeah, so uh, somebody asked for the DuckDuckGo, but uh, Steve was able to put that in the chat, the website. Uh, awesome. one, of the things, one of the things that um, a story that I like to share, obviously, is from a, uh, television. Um, there was the movie Coming to America, oh, yeah. Coming to America 2, where the father-in-law um, had McDonald's without the D and uh, he had the double arches and it looked exactly, instead of the Big Mac, it was the Big Mic. That's so right. uh, I know that was a, a funny movie, but you know, that stuff can be very, very dangerous. Um, so here's one more question from Debbie Edmonds. Um, hey, is Debbie. it ever too late to purchase the assignment of right for a logo? Gosh, no. Gosh, no, Debbie. You may not even have to purchase it, but I would give some. If it's been a while, do give some consideration, five bucks, ten bucks, something. But use me as your straw man. I'll even slowly pronounce my name so you've got the bad guy typified. Doug Lineberry. 
I was on this thing Tuesday night. This madman kept telling me that I need an assignment or he's going to yell at me. Because I'm telling you now, you need an assignment or I or your attorney are going to yell at you. If you don't have it, go get it. It is never too late. That's the problem with copyright, though, is because remember, when your artist creates it, if it's a single person, it lasts their lifespan, whether they make it to 110, 120, whatever they go to, plus another 70 years. So no, no time is too late. Go get it now. I will send Ted or Steve or Mary Jo or somebody an assignment that they can disseminate to you guys. But right now, you go get it. You use me as the bad guy. Crazy attorney, some doofus hillbilly from South Carolina said I had to have this, and he was really serious about it. Because I am really serious about it. It can come back to haunt you if you don't get it. Other questions, guys? These are perfect. Cool. All right, Winifred, you've been hanging out in the corner. I see you. I might be coming to you with the question soon. Just let me know. But one thing, too, guys, when you jump on the Internet, even if it looks old, it doesn't mean that you can use it. Um, copyright protection dies about 1913. So that's 1913, you know, over 100 years back. Be very careful lifting anything off the internet, especially something that looks fresh and cool, because it probably is somebody's and it probably has a copyright attached to it. And if they find you, they more than likely than not will send you a demand letter or some exorbitant number after a U.S. or Canadian dollar sign saying, I want money. So remember, just like Steve said, free can be very expensive. Um, copyright pitfalls, guys, don't use it without permission and then cite the source. That's beautiful. It's kind of like the, here's how you find me guilty of infringement how-to list. People literally think that if I attribute a picture, if I attribute a song, if I attribute a picture, eh, I'm going over again. But if I attribute anything from a third person, then I'm okay. I've done a good thing. I'm not plagiarizing. Remember though, guys, attribution is not infringement. The copyright artist, until like Debbie, you get the assignment from them, the copyright artist is the only person who can use a picture or that song or that video or whatever it may be. They're the only person, unless they gave Winifred a license or Stedman a license or Eugenia a license or an assignment. If you don't have that, guys, all you've done is say, here's what I stole from you. Oh, here's my confirmation that I stole it from you. Infringement is not contribution. Infringement is using copyright material that you don't have the right to use. And guys, that's why I hit on this assignment thing so much, because if we have an artist working for you, if it's a software coder, if it's a graphic designer, if it's a person making music, if it's a person making videos, if it's a person taking pictures, you need to have an assignment to copy what they do for you. I mean, cover, not copy, to cover what they've done for you. If you do not, they keep the copyright and they can monetize it just like Omar suggested earlier. And they might monetize it by suing you for infringement if you do not get that assignment from them. Um, licenses, guys, you know, like Ted mentioned earlier, if we go out and we get a license from one of these places to use art, read it, make certain that we know what it's for. It might just say, hey, you can only use it for the web page. Uh, you can only use it on business cards. You know, make certain that you know what you can use it for. Because if you do not, you might use it outside the boundaries of it. They may come back for another license or may send you a cease and desist letter. So if you're going to use those art forms, if you're going to go with these people, read that agreement and make certain it fits what you need it to do for your business. You know, if it says, hey, you can use this clip art on the website, that's awesome. But if you're a realtor out there sending out flyers and business cards, that's probably not what you need. Um, Self-help trademarks, guys. We noticed Michael used an attorney to do his. I'm 100% about you always using an attorney, guys. Copyrights, you can do yourself. We can train you to do that. Trademarks are tricky. And they're tricky because they look so damn easy. It's just a form you fill out. You'll provide a copy of your website. You'll spell it for them. It's pretty simple stuff. But here's the problem. If we don't check our names, we might be too close to somebody. We might get a 2D rejection. Uh, selecting the wrong class. You know, when I was asking Michael about what they did, there are 40-odd classes of trademarks. And what this means is that leather saddles are in one class, tank tops are in another, and a Bloody Mary mix is in yet a third class. We have to be very careful that we put our things in the right class. You know, like if we're Omar's nonprofit, you know, we don't want to say that we're a bank. You know, if we're Daryl's company that makes, um, they make, um, I don't know, they make adhesive tape. We don't want to say that we make tar. You know, we want to be very careful how we classify. 
um, being too broad for your goods. You know, sometimes if you have marks kind of like Michael with his cores, sometimes you want to go very narrow. You know, I've done that for a company. And y'all, when I tell you trademark names, you can go check on them. They're all public records, so I'm not giving away any confidential info. But I had a client called Humimic, and they actually used human bones to help mimic test subjects for nurses. So that when they're doing, you know, like using a, a syringe or putting on a pacemaker or learning how to do these things, they make them out of actual bone so that they get the full human experience. But there was also a German company called Humanic that did um, essentially like a bio service, but it was very different than our guys. And so we phrased ourselves very narrowly, intentionally, so that we didn't trample on these other guys' rights. We got a first off section allowance. It was done. You know, so they're broad and narrow. I would prefer we go as broad as we can. But if you're like my guys, and again, they went out, they had a name, they hadn't searched. They came to me and said, hey, we want this trademark. I'm like, hey, these guys do like biological additives for mixes and big plants. You guys do a biological nature of a different sort. We need to precisely define it. You know, that's one way we can overcome this. Uh, but again, you don't want to be too narrow. You know, like I've seen people roll in, like the NFL is one of the worst examples of this. Go look up any NFL franchise, you know, the Dolphins, the Saints, whomever. They've got pencils. They've got horse saddles. They've got snow gloves, blah, 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 blah. There are ways that their attorneys could have made those very broad to commercial, <clears throat> excuse me, to cover a host of goods. But instead, they put on tank tops and they put on French cut shirts. You know, it's silly stuff. You know, I want you guys to think your trademark needs to be as broad as we can get it. But we don't want it too narrow that it actually omits your goods. You know, like if you come into a trademark like Chad, let's say that you've got a, a clothing company, you make tuxedos. And you come in and you file in class 25 and you file mark Chad Shaw. And so we're going to file Chad Shaw and we get it for class 25 just for tuxedos. If you start making cargo shorts, guess what? You're not covering it. We should have filed for clothing. And that's completely fine. You can file for tops of clothing, bottoms of clothing. Show me a piece of clothing that's not a top or a bottom, and I will buy you a butter beer down there at Stedman's Bar. Because it's impossible sometimes to be too narrow in these things. But it's also extremely possible to think short term and not long term. So I want you all to get that, hey, we want to protect our business, not just the way it looks here June 27th, 2021, or July, sorry, but the way that it might look in July 27th, 2042. Um, also, guys, you know, one thing Joy talked about was like looking at your domain name. A lot of people confuse owning a domain name with owning a trademark. They are not the same. They absolutely positively are not the same. If you own the domain name, it has no benefit to the trademark. If you own the trademark, it has no bearing on the domain name. Apples and oranges, guys. Apples and oranges. Another thing, failure to enforce. Uh, we've got a restaurant up here called Gather. They've taken cargo units, and I helped them with the trademarks on it. It's very cool. They've got all these different restaurants that are in cargo containers. And you can go there, and you can have sushi in one. You can have Italian in the next. You can have French cuisine in the next one. Pizza in the one beside it, and the hamburgers at the two behind it. Very cool concept. And their trademark is Gather. You guys can look it up out of Greenville, South Carolina. We just had an issue with a Gather in North Carolina who tried to be clever by going Gather and see. And what it was is they came down to Greenville. We're a big tourist thing in the Southeast. You know, so they came, they saw car, cargo and they saw the gather and they saw how cool it was. They said, hey, you know what? I like this. I'm going to use this mark. And that's the exact opposite of what I'm telling you guys to do. Because, A, as soon as we found out about it, we went after them. And so I got a letter back from their attorney saying, lo and behold, uh, they're going to change the name. And lo and behold, they're going to take down the sign. And that's awesome for my guys, but it sucks for them because they paid for that signage. You know, they've got to repaint some stuff. They can't use the website. That's got to be redesigned. It's a lot of money that can be avoided with a simple search on the front end. We want good, clear marks. If we have good, clear marks, guys, that's when your biggest hurdles out of the way. Just go and make your customers happy after that. Trade now, before you go on, uh, Mr. Sorry, Daniel, Daniel Omar had another question. Hey, Omar. Hey, all right. So um, earlier you mentioned that um, announcing the source of the art is just announcing who you stole it from. Um, you know, recently uh, we, I had about four videos um, blocked on Facebook uh, that we posted like a year ago that included some artwork, was some music from some you know artists, and okay. um, I noticed that people tend to put in their in their in their videos, "I do not own the rights um, to this particular song." Um, is that valid? If you have the rights, if you don't, that's wrong. 
So what I would do, Omar, is reach out to the uh, musician or better yet, get a musician to make your own stuff for you. But if you really want that song, you can reach out to the musician or you can reach out to BMI or ASCAP. Um, you know, if this is a, a, a known registered act, and again, they cover 99% of the world between the two, and that's BMI, Boy, Marine, Indigo, or ASCAP, Apple, Snake, uh, Cockroach, Apple, okay, uh, Pineapple, Pineapple. You can go to those to get music rights, but if it's like a small act or something, you may just want to get a written agreement from them to use it, but you never want to say, hey, YouTube, I've got permission to use this song when you don't. But if they do block you for that, there are sort of appeals processes to use to where you can contact them and say, look, I do have permission for this song. Here's my writing from the artist saying that I can use it. That's a great Thank question. You. Yeah, no, a good question. Guys, anybody else? Cool. You know, like we touched on before earlier, guys, copyrights. Last Sorry, one, one question. Yeah, Sorry to interrupt you. Um, shapes. Uh, my business is cutting boards, I mean, cutting okay. boards and trays and all kinds of stuff, uh, primarily in the shapes of the islands. Okay. And um, is that something that can be trademarked? Yeah, you can actually get like a trade dress on it. Uh, your, what's your name, Chad? Uh, Shura Designs. <laughs> Hold on. Now, by doing this, you're giving me permission to do what I did to Michael. Michael's like, thank God, yep. somebody else is on there. So let's check and see what we got. Shura Designs. Now, it's your surname. Um, how common is the surname Shara, Chad? The reason I'm asking is that, believe it or not, the PTO will sometimes buck up if you have a very common surname like Jones or something. So how common is Shara? Not, not very common that I've seen. Good. And let's see what's going on. Can you guys see the website block thing? We well, could. I just X'd off of it. Okay, we'll go back to our old friend, PTO.gov. Remember, dot com is a sand trap that we don't want to get into. Want to go to trademarks, go to Pretty Girl Tests. We go to basic word mark search. Now we're going to look for live and dead. Let's see how popular Shara is. And I'm going to put asterisks on both ends of it, Chad, just to see what comes up. If I could uh -huh. uh, type, I'd be so dangerous. And spell. Okay, so we've got Shara. If there's anything on either side or front or back, it should pop up live and dead. Boom. No hits. That's a great thing. So we're not seeing a lot of marks using that. And again, y'all, that's a very broad search. Let's go ahead and take the W off of it just for some fanatic search real quick. Boom. Now we got 138 of them. What I always like to do is let's go back and see how many are live just so we get an idea of the universe. 38 records that you were looking through here. You know, here's Shara. Translates as Shara, no meaning for language. Cooking oil and olive oils. You know, Chad, that's not an issue for you. Um, Sheraton, hotel chain, not an issue for you. Don't do cutting boards so much. Here's a Shara, um, no meaning in foreign language, organic skin and body care cosmetics. Again, not an issue for you. But this is the way we would do the search. You know, here's a fresh Shara. Let's see what's going on here. Vacuum cleaners, nothing to do with you. Probably fresh era is how you pronounce that one. Um, Sheraton, Sheraton, Sheraton. Again, you've got a lot of hotel marks and some of these others. That You lost your audio, Doug. You're muted. While Doug's getting back uh, online or getting back his, his audio, uh, let's uh, just uh, remind everyone that if you need assistance or further information about some of the things that uh, Doug has spoken about tonight, uh, you have two agencies uh, obviously on this call, uh, the Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center, which we will put our contact information uh, towards the end of the webinar, but also um, Steve Clayton, the gentleman with the blue shirt, he actually uh, is uh, working for SCORE, uh, US or, or VI SCORE. And uh, we're partnering with SCORE. Uh, they're looking to broaden their, um, their presence down here in the Virgin Islands. So look for some uh, SCORE things coming up in the next few months and over the next year. 
as we work with them to expand uh, the presence down here in the Virgin Islands. But it's a fantastic resource uh, for small businesses down here. So, Doug, it looks like you're back in. Awesome. Ted, can you hear me? Yes, sir. You got it. Apparently, all we've got to do is unplug it. You know, guys, what we talked about earlier, you know, we're looking at Mr. Shaw's mark. We've got this Astra. Remember how I said about being too specific? Perfect example. You know, look at this, guys. All of this can simply be covered with tops. And let's see if they even put bottoms in here. Wham trunks fit on the bottom of the human. But this is what I mean, guys. This is why using an attorney is a good thing for you. Because this Asherah swimwear, they should have said, we make tops, we make bottoms. And they can make whatever they want. If they want to do a kimono, that's awesome. If they want to do a sarong, that's awesome. Because here's the problem. This mark registered Jan 19, 2016. It is now due for its uh, update. It's going to have a uh, surcharge coming in here soon saying, hey, we need to get you registered, my friend. Hey, Doug, we can't can you see your screen. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. My fault. Let's see, bear with trying to find it guys bear with nope that's my email you don't care about that hold on guys it's a lot harder to find this thing than you would think ah can y'all now see uh we're back on this ash raw mark where they went very narrow on what they chose yep and when they went down here you'll notice something they had to do which is kind of obnoxious and they've not done it yet actually when we go back to this mark as i'll do gently they have to provide an example of swimwear, tops, t-shirts, sweaters, kimonos, dresses, sarongs, hats, visors. They literally have to provide an example of every single one of these. That's why I would prefer when we do marks, we're going to do tops and bottoms. We get away with two pictures. These guys have to provide a picture of everything in this list. And guess what? If they have things that aren't in this list and they don't have pictures for them, then they've got to amend the mark to cut those out. So again, one reason I would tell you not to use a legal zoom is they'll file exactly what you tell them to. If you go to an attorney, one worth their salt is going to sit down with you and say, hey, we just go for tops and bottoms because, you know, you might be making swimsuits, you might be making lingerie, you might be making kimonos also, but we want broad coverage, guys. And again, it's amazing how you find this stuff on the office when you look for it. Um, tell me, guys, does this take us back to the presentation? Can y'all see the presentation now? Awesome. I didn't know that we could switch it that way. Um, again, harping and back on this point, our copyrights last forever. These blasted things can go up to 120 years if it's an anonymous work. Remember, that's what got my client in trouble in North Carolina, was thinking anonymous meant free, like Steve said, free costs. Indeed, it costs 73,000 times a fee. So um, what we want to make certain of is that, guys, we want to be very careful of lifting stuff. I don't want you to use it unless you have permission. If you don't have permission, do not use it. Um, you'll notice again, the word assignments, guys. I can't harp on this enough for small companies. It gets people in trouble if it's not done right. Again, if it's not assigned, you don't own it. And like Ted said, it's a very simple thing, a couple pages. Not a telephone book, very straightforward. For your licenses, I'm sorry, was that a question, guys? Are you back on the presentation, Doug? I hope I am. I mean, you guys not seeing it? No, we're seeing the Asherah. Yeah, that, get, that gets on me for being too clever. Thank you, Mary. Let's jump on here. You just click on new share. There we go. Can y'all see it now? Yep. You. We're nearly done with this one, guys. And again, I do appreciate your patience on it. This is the last slide of this one. But to go back over it, obtain those assignments. We don't want dangling copyrights. We don't want them. They will come back to haunt you. Review your licenses. What can you can and can't do with them? Your NDAs, and an NDA stands for Non-Disclosure Agreement. And you realize when you guys come to the SBDC, they sign a non-disclosure agreement with you. Like Chad, they give you one. Ida, they give you one. Dina, they give you one. Daryl, you get one. Yvette, you get one. Debbie, Che, Kay, everybody. When you go to the SBDC, they promise to keep your information sacrosanct. Nobody gets a hold of it. When you guys are going out to talk to venture capitalists or other people, I want you to use non-disclosure agreements. And especially if you have not protected anything. You know, Joyce said, hey, what about checking on these websites? And I've noticed that that sometimes causes the price to go up. The price can go up a whole lot if you guys divulge a new business to somebody without first taking steps to protect your IP. So what we want to do is to make certain if we are still have dangling patents or if we've not filed our copyright registrations, if we've not protected our trademarks, 
we want to use a non-disclosure agreement. And I'll tell you this, if they won't sign or that you can either walk away or maybe talk to them very generally, but do not get them nuts and bolts of it, guys. If they don't sign it, again, this is not your friend. This is somebody who's haggling with you, bargaining with you, negotiating with you, who's saying, oh, I don't want to keep your stuff secret. So maybe you don't tell them too much. Um, again, also with attorneys, guys, have to sign those policies. We're going to jump to trade secrets here in just a second, but we do want to file our trademarks, you know, just like Michael's done with his. We want to register those copyrights. And that's for your websites, it's for your photographs, it's for your original creations. It's for anything that you've got. You know, like kind of like Chad is saying, Chad might want to do uh, copyrights on his cutting boards. He has some cool, he can protect that look. Uh, he probably wants to file on his Shira trade name because guess what? That looked pretty bleak when we were looking at it. There weren't any uses of it. So he does have the ability to build on that branding, but he'll want to protect it because if he doesn't protect it, here's what could happen. Uh, Joy is also in the cutting board business. She's from Texas. Uh, Joy is going to move down to the yacht, man. She's going to retire. She's seen this play. She was Saw there, so she saw a couple presentations, a couple pictures, like I'm moving there, I'm done. Well, she files for Shira trademark for cutting boards because you know she liked it. She was like, it's a it's a Texas saying for yeehaw or something. She filed on it. She moves to the Virgin Islands. Chad has not filed on Shira, but is selling uh, cutting boards down there. Chad is now put in what we call the fishbowl. Joy has a federally registered mark for Shira for cutting boards. She moves to the islands. She can now encapsulate Chad. Chad is only able to sell those boards or use the mark Shara or use the marks associated with those boards in the area he was selling in when Joy got there. Again, it's the fishbowl. You can look out and you can see all this territory, but you can't get to it. Joy, meanwhile, filed a federal trademark. She's got it registered. She moves in. She puts Chad in a little fishbowl, and then she can take the Joy cutting boards and sell them wherever she wants to. But reverse it, Chad registers his and says, hey, I'm moving to Texas. Joy has not registered hers. He gets to fishbowl her and then has all of Texas, the U.S., everywhere else to look at to expand for cutting boards. So, guys, these trademarks are more than just kind of locking a name in place. They're business expansion. They're ability to fend off competitors. If you file a trademark, just like we saw in Michael's, if it's too close to another mark, the trademark office steps in and says, hey, I'm not going to give you this. You've got to do things to your mark or I'm not going to give it to you because I think it's too similar to these others. Trademarking and copyright are massively important and we need y'all to really appreciate that. You know, guys, as I switch over, I know I talked really fast, so I'm gonna give you guys a chance to ask questions. Doug, I'm gonna, I'm gonna email you a couple of questions from the chat uh, that are pretty, they go into a little bit more detail. We'll get, we'll get those answers back, but I do wanna, I do wanna bring up this point. Uh, because one of the questions kind of had to do with cruise lines. So all of the copyrights, trademarks uh, that are that are um, filed here in the U.S. Uh -huh. uh, are they only for the U.S. or if there's is there uh, like a um, another someone in uh, let's say Italy steals yep. my name? Yep. Right. Great question, Ted. And here's the reason that is: trademarks, patents, copyrights are territorial. Copyrights, again, because they get way, way more protection than everything else, have various treaties that will make an American mark enforceable elsewhere. Patents and trademarks, if you want to protect it in Italy, you've got to file in Italy. You know, again, the U.S. is still the best market on the planet, guys. Don't let the media fool you. We're going to be the best market for a long, long, long time. But if you're going to be in Europe or if you're going to be in Japan or if you're going to be in Australia, if you're going to be in Canada, if you're going to be in Mexico, if you're going to be in Central America, and you're going to have a significant business presence there, you probably want to look at protecting your marks there because Ted hit it on the head. You know, if we've got a U.S. trademark, it has no bearing in Italy until we file a U.S. trademark, uh, or sorry, the, until we file an Italian trademark because otherwise it's just a U.S. trademark that lives in the U.S. and the territories. It doesn't live anywhere else. It has no power anywhere else. But if we're going to set up an Italian manufacturing center, you better believe we're going to file for our trademarks there. That's a great question, Ted. So people that have products that they're manufacturing and they manufacture them in China, they should get a trademark in China? Fantastic question, Mary Jo. No, don't trust the Chinese. They are the greatest intellectual property thieves on the planet. Um, they're bad. And I know everybody's like, oh, it's so disfavorable to talk about them. They're bad. And I get it. We get a lot of stuff made over there, guys. But trust me, if company A is making it for you, company B is probably going to try to make it for somebody else that'll make money. 
um, I would encourage you not to use China as a source. I think Vietnam, India, Mexico, we have some great production companies that really do respect intellectual property rights. But Mary, you're like, hey, if I'm having this built in China, what do I do? What I mean by market presence, Mary Jo, is that if we have a sales force in China, yeah, we probably do want to look at it. If we're selling product there, but if we're just getting it made and shipped back to us, we don't want that. But remember, too, we do want a U.S. trademark because if the Chinese guys at Company B try to ship in infringing product that may have our brand on it, a U.S. trademark will let you go to the uh, border services, the Coast Guard, and say, hey, you can't let this stuff in. This is my trademark. These are infringing items. So that is a great reason to have a trademark is that let's say we were having it built in China, an infringer starts trying to ship it in, a U.S. trademark can have that blocked at the border. And it's really a simple fee. They put it on the list and they start going through the containers looking for what's coming out. So that's a great question, Mary Jo. Unless you have or making sales, boots on the ground store someplace, I wouldn't suggest that we get a trademark in that particular venue, but we do want our U.S. mark because it can prevent counterfeits from coming in from elsewhere. Um, I'm going down to Kay Robel. She had a question. So to be clear, you can register a name product here, but if I move, I need to register it in another place if I move. Okay, if you move out of the U.S. to the territories with a U.S. mark, yep. If you go to Canada and you're going to start doing business there, get a Canadian trademark. Going to Mexico, same thing. Um, but if you're just moving within the U.S., no, you're fine. Territories, um, states, whatever, you're good to go. Uh, let's see. So the trademark is only about in, that's right. They're literally just a territorial right. And again, it and patents have that same limited scope. Copyrights have a lot bigger scope due to various treaties that enable Walt Disney to protect itself in China, Japan, Australia, wherever it may be. Guys, any other questions? These are really good questions. A, a question. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Thank you. Um, to what extent can we utilize this information, especially since we're speaking about property rights? Oh, <laughs> I have a lot go. of clients and I would like to share this information. To what extent can I share it? I'll tell you what, Darren, why don't we just set up a Zoom with your clients? I'm happy to do that. You say when. I mean, you can give them the seminar, but once they say all the misspellings, they're probably going to lose faith in you. <laughs> kidding, kidding. But no, if you guys ever want me to do this for you, the SBDC knows I'm on the short line. But Daryl, if you ever want to do it for your clients, I'm a big proponent in education. Both of my parents were teachers. My kid's sister's a teacher. The more we teach people, especially entrepreneurs, the better business. That's all there is to it. If you'd like me to do this for them, happy, no charge, you say when. And I'll just have to apparently unplug the microphone a time or two, and we're good to go. And Mr. Edwards, just to remind uh, you and everyone else on the call, um, of course, uh, now with Doug's permission, we'll post this on our YouTube channel uh, so that we can, it'll always be there. So anyone wants to go to our YouTube channel, uh, they can see the recorded version of this. So Absolutely. And just ignore the uh, mal malfunction with the microphone. I'll yell at it later. Now, guys, we're going to jump over to the next one now, and we're going to be looking at inv uh, inventions. I was going to say invitations because it's getting late on Tuesday night, but we're going to be looking at inventions and trade secrets. Think of this as patents and our secret recipes. That These are what we have to keep ourselves out of trouble. Now, with IP, like we talked about to initially begin, a lot of people think, I don't have it. All of you do have it. All of you have a trademark, if you have a company name or a logo, all of you have a copyright, if you have a graphic design, if you have art you use, if you have software you've created, you know, or if you've had someone create it for you, get an assignment, but you all have copyright materials. You also all have trade secrets, I promise you. This is customer lists, market expansion plans, new trademarks, new copyright items that might be coming out. All of these are trade secrets, guys. We don't want these going out to anybody until we're either A, under a non-disclosure agreement, or we're okay with the public knowing about it. Um, again, a lot of people are like, hey, I don't need this IP stuff. Um, it's funny. I was talking to Mary Jo earlier. One of her um, compatriots up here, Katrina Meeks in Spartanburg, about 35 minutes north, um, had a new client roll into the SBDC for Spartanburg, has a patentable invention, but kind of like Ted was just talking about, they did a YouTube video of it. They've gotten up and shown people about it. And I, I, so Ted just put his hand across his head. I, I did something a little worse. It only involved one finger, Ted. But I'm like, why do people do this? 
because guys, anybody on here, Sharon, I'm talking to you, Che, K. Robles, Stedman, Winifred, Shanita, Celia, anybody, until you have your IP in place, no YouTube videos, you know, no going to a million cups and standing up. I mean, I, I got a client one time due to an SBDC member who was quick on the draw. They were at a Charleston one million cups thing. Do y'all have that in the island jet where the entrepreneurs stand up and they explain why they're there and other entrepreneurs are there and they kind of network it's all over the uh, coast here. People have been doing it for a few years, but a guy in Charleston gets up, a college student who had designed a new uh, charger for his cell phone that essentially fixed a wall because college dorms only have like one outlet. And so they've got this thing looking like the Griswold family Christmas album. And this guy's like, hey, I'm going to take a portable charger. You'll be able to fix it on the wall and you can get the battery out to charge it anytime you want, but you can put it right back in. Minimal fuss, minimal muss. Gets up and shows it to all of these people in Charleston. Guys, that's a disclosure. For an invention, for a patent, you've triggered a one-year deadline. If you do not file a patent before that one year, you're out of luck. And I've got bad news for you. You know, we were talking about the cousins in China, the cousins in Japan, the cousins in Australia, the cousins in Canada, Mexico, anywhere else. If we publish before we have a patent on file, we utterly lose the ability to form and protect the patent. We can't do it. We can't go to Japan. We can't go to Australia. We can't go to Europe. doesn't matter if we have the biggest manufacturing facility in Germany. We cannot get a patent there if we disclose it before a patent application is on file. It's uh, The U.S. is a different system. We give you one year, but the rest of the planet is absolute novelty for all the industrialized countries, meaning that if you want to talk about something, you better have a patent application. If you do not, you're fixed and not fixed in a good way. Um, but again, guys, understand that all of you have this. I'm not a big proponent of protecting IP unless you've been trained. Like we can train you guys how to do copyrights. It's easy. It takes about 45 minutes. We'll go through it. We'll do it on a daggone Zoom, and I will show you literally how to click the buttons. But unless you've been trained at that, guys, if you don't surf, don't start, because one of my favorite clients in the upstate is fostering great ideas. And uh, to tell you how savage we are in Greenville, until these guys came about, we had foster children who would be moved from home to home using garbage bags. Now, think about this. You're a foster child. You're in a situation with a foster family where it's not working. You know, for various reasons, that child's got to go somewhere else. And they give this kid, a young adult, a trash bag to put their world belongings in to go from spot A to spot B. I don't know about y'all, but that upsets me. It makes me feel bad. And I'm not a very touchy-feely kind of guy, but I love kids and I love animals. And tell you what, if I'm a kid and I'm given a trash bag and said, put your belongings in it, that kind of sucks. That, that sends a lot of bad messages. That's some bad mojo. What Fostering Great Ideas did is they went up to BMW and Michelin. We've got both those in Greenville. And um, Milliken, another big plant up in Spartanburg, said, hey, I need money to buy 500 sets of luggage. I want to be able to let these kids transitioning from home A to home B to be able to do so with respect and dignity. Guess what? They said all of a sudden, instead of giving somebody a trash bag, they get a suitcase, behavioral issues went down. It was easier to get people to move from A to B. The kids went to this new place and felt like they had some control over a situation that they had very little input into. These guys are awesome. But, and this is uh, David White. He's actually my neighbor, and he's given me permission to tell the story till the end of time. I do all their trademarks for free. Omar, don't look at me funny. I didn't say yours are free. But I did all of their marks for free because David, being a doofus, filed a dozen trademarks. And again, y'all, fostering great ideas. Look them up. Awesome group. But he filed a dozen trademarks wrong. He filed them all as indicating he's a foster care agency. The thing about trademarks, the thing about copyright registrations, the thing about patents, they're very unforgiving. If you fill out the forms wrong, guys, or if you don't put the right information in, the government doesn't like to give you a redo on that. They hold your feet to the fire. You know, there's no participation trophy for trademarks. And what had happened was is you've got a nonprofit that has no money that had spent at the time the fee was $200. You know, they'd spent roughly 2500 bucks on a dozen worthless trademarks. To make it even better, we were, I saw Ted kind of do the smirk, Ted, it gets even better. We were doing a presentation back live when people used to do those things at the Greenville Chamber of Commerce. David stood up and loudly and proudly announced to the room that he had filed a dozen trademarks on his own. Now, you guys don't know me that well yet, but I'm a little volatile. And so I'm sitting here watching this guy stand up at the back of the room as I'm telling people, don't do your own IP. 
And he goes, I filed a dozen trademarks on my own. I kid y'all not, he actually came to my office six months later, later, hand in hand, with a 12 of these marks saying, can you help me? I don't know what went wrong. I've done 35 marks for them. We've got like five more to file, y'all. I'm a very forgiving kind of guy. But I'll tell you this, if you don't surf, don't start. We had a great organization, lost 2,500 bucks that we can't get back. They don't give refunds. Since they did this wrong, they lost that money. I don't want that happening to y'all. Find you an IP attorney you like and trust, somebody you can talk to, bounce these ideas off of. That will make your business so much more secure from step zero, guys. If you don't do that and you're kind of thinking, I'll do it loosey-goosey or don't do it, bad things happen. And bad things happen all the time. Also, if you're doing this on your own, and again, I don't encourage that. I mean, like you filed your own copyright registration after we show you. If you get back a ding from the copyright office and it says you have until X date to respond, they mean it. If you don't respond, you will lose it and you will also lose any fees that you paid up to that point. So guys, if you don't surf, don't start. Grab a experienced IP attorney to help you do this stuff. It is worth its weight in gold and it really will secure your company. You know, Ted will tell you, Steve will tell you, Mary Jo will tell you, everybody will tell you that if you're looking for a, a if you're looking for any sort of succession planning, they're going to ask about your IP. They're going to ask about your branding. They're going to ask about your trade secrets. They want to know how have you protected these things. And that's what tonight's about is getting that base underline to know that all of you have it and that it has to be protected. Now, our inventions, guys, like we talked about, we do not discuss inventions unless we've got a patent application on file, and it doesn't have to be a perfect one. We can file what's called a provisional application or a cover sheet application. Cover sheets are down and dirty. It literally is, could be your napkin descriptions of this thing with some filing implements on it. You know, we want to make certain that that's protected. A, a provisional application can be a more fleshed out one. Uh, you can go for utility, meaning that's the one an examiner sees. That's the one that people want to talk about. A couple of caveats. Patents are expensive. Patents are slow. Now, again, I talk fast, so I'm going to rewind. Patents are expensive. Patents are slow. We want to make certain going in that we know that we've got a good chance of getting this patent. I advise anybody with an idea of an invention or a new widget or a new machine or a new fusion reactor, do a patentability search first before we start going down the path of applications. It's fine to do like a cover sheet provisional quickly to protect it and then do a search. But if you're looking at doing a full-blown utility, guys, they're expensive, they cost a lot of money, and it will take you a long time to hear back that maybe we should have done a search. Because if you don't do this search, you don't know what you don't know. And occasionally, like Steve said, free is expensive. And I want all y'all to be aware of this, especially for small companies. I think it is a smart thing to do a patentability search for any invention. Let's figure out what's out there. It helps us craft a much better application. You know, um, I actually have a client now. We just filed for it. You guys can check it out in 18 months when it publishes. Uh, their concept is called the boom shape. And what it is, is they have on the boom of a boat, and that's the, I had to learn these terms, so I'm acting like I know something about nautical terms. But the boom is the part of the boat that swivels, that goes perpendicular to the deck. Uh, essentially holds the bottom part of the cell. He had an affixation mechanism so that he can now put a solar cell that will go out to create shade and or surface area to generate power for the boat. Brilliant concept, but we did a patentability search before we filed anything. And, you know, and uh, Jerry Three Feathers is his name, great guy. And so Jerry was really familiar with the industry. He said, there's nothing out here like this, guys. He goes, I boat all the time. I've looked at it. He goes to the islands a lot. He was like, I go to the places where this thing would be, and it's not there. We did a patentability search, found one item where an application was filed, but was never commercialized. Jerry ends up doing some behind the grounds uh, Charlotte homing finds out that the company couldn't get it to work, but Jerry's invention fixed that. Because we did that patentability search, his art is the closest thing to us, the company that can't get theirs to work. Jerry's is vastly different from that and has designed around it. And what we did was we focused on knocking that out in our patent. But I also am holding that one up as a great big kick me sign to the patent office to say, hey, raise this art against us because we know what it is. We know how we're going to get around it. We know how to address this with the examiner. And it's kind of like a, come on to our turf and we'll see how this works. But guys, absolutely do patentability searches. For a process this long and expensive, knowledge is every bit of a weapon that you want to be able to use. 
like we talked about before, we don't publish anything. Ted, did you have a question? I saw you light up. Yeah, so uh, actually Miss Havens has a question. So if you hey, can unmute yourself, Miss Havens. Yes, um, are there instances where an item can qualify for a copyright trademark and a part a patent like multiple, like oh, maybe a podcast or something? You're the devil lady. Yes, there are. Let's go to, <laughs> so no, no, it's a great question. Um, I've got a client, hold up, I'll show you all something. I'm a pack rat, I'm not apologizing for it. Uh, these are vegetative sheets. And uh, this is for a, a utility application I got allowed years ago, but my office is kind of like a trash can for the parts you can't see. But as y'all can see, this is just a little plastic enclosure that you can close up. It goes around like tree stems and stuff, or you can wear his armor around your house if you fight your kids a lot. But you put it around the tree and it prevents a weed eater from being able to hit into it. But also, I'll hold it a little closer. You can see all these various holes that are made into it. It does something very smart. It allows light and air egress. A lot of times you'll see people put a piece of PVC that they put a slot in around the sapling or something. That's bad for the tree. It blocks sunlight, it blocks airflow. It encourages um, moisture growth, especially in dark, which is bad. This little baby, you put this around grapevines, the patent we filed will show you, it creates a marked difference because not only does it protect them, but it also creates a little bit of shade too. So it lessens the internal temperature of it. So if you have like drought or hot weather conditions, here you go. Joey's like, why are you talking about this? I just asked a simple question. This bad boy, Joy, has a utility patent on it. It has a design patent on the way it looks. It has a trademark on the name. Uh, they called it the uh, Mary Plast Sure Sleeve. And we filed a copyright on the look of the bad boy. So absolutely, it is potential that all of you may have all four areas of it. And you said, what about a podcast? Um, you can't really get a patent on a podcast. You know, that, that's an entertainment thing that you can absolutely have a trademark on it. You can get a copyright registration on it. Right. And guess what, Joy? The way you make it, the way you film it, maybe your lighting is at certain angles. Maybe you got a particular hues. You've got tricks of the trade or trade secrets that you use to make it work. So it can absolutely have at least three. Um, now, if you came up with a brand new way of showing a podcast, like you've got a hologram, boom, we're in it now. It's all four. But yes, you can have a product that crosses into every single one of the things we discussed tonight. Okay, thank you. I know it's an awesome question. Thank you. Um, you know, guys, going back to it though, be careful. You know, we want to be very, very careful because you know what happens is, you know, let's say that I'm, you know, like I was talking about this guy in Spartanburg, he doesn't, you know, he's not done the patent yet, but he's out there on YouTube. And the problem is, if we file within a year, we're okay. But let's say devil's advocate, he put this thing on there last June, June of 2020. Well, now we're a year past it. Let's say that he has made a couple tweaks to it. He has done something to say, hey, I have you know, improved upon my design. Here's the problem. His own work on YouTube that he created with nobody else helping him is now prior art because it was put out there and not protected. It is now able to be used against him, kind of like a Miranda rug. What you say can and will be used against you. If you say too much about your patents, they absolutely can hurt you. And in this case, it can be prior art. I had a similar thing. It was a guy who brought in a gutter. Um, I guess it's probably been six or seven years ago, y'all. And he's selling these things all over town. And he got the way he wanted to protect them. And I'm like, that's awesome. Bring it in. And y'all, you could snap this thing onto an existing gutter. It was like a leaf guard barrier. And it was a, a removable and tiltable hinged. So you can literally just like, if you want to get rid of your leaves, just flip that thing. Granted, it all fall on your face, but it worked very well. And you could assemble it very quickly. Problem was, he'd been selling them for three years before he even came to see me. And a sale, a publication, a YouTube video, guys, all this stuff can hurt you. And it can generate prior art. Because what he thought was, oh, wait, I'm now using different materials. Or wait, I've changed the hinge. But he hadn't done enough to where we could argue that that prior disclosure couldn't impact the new one. So you can be your own worst enemy if you don't take timely action on your patents. Uh, also, you know, we don't want to give our competitors an insight, guys. One thing that folks do is they will search um, their competitors' trademarks, like uh, Sony. All these guys will go out and search for trademarks that their competitors are filing to see what kind of products may be coming. They might be able to glean something from the name. And so remember, if you filed it, you're protected. But there are also ways that I encourage all of you, like Chad, you know, let's say the uh, Hogwarts Express, you wanted to see if somebody had one that was named after Snape. You know, you just want to see it. You can go check the trademark office to see if there's a severed Snape bar someplace. 
So there are a lot of different ways, guys, that we can use this IP, not only to protect ourselves, but also to find out about our competitors. Like Daryl Edwards, if you've got a competitor in your industry, you can go see if they filed trademarks. You can go see if they filed patents. Now, there is an underwater period. For trademarks, it's much shorter. They typically pop up in about three weeks. For patents, it's a very long underwater period. It's 18, one, eight months from the time you file a patent until the time it publishes so people can see it. If you file a cover sheet provisional or a provisional, they never publish. They only last a year, but they never publish. So you'll never see those. But if you file a full-blown utility, it'll be 18 months underwater before it surfaces and we can see the periscope sticking up. Guys, questions. I realize I talk fast. Yes. What about companies like InventTech? Awesome. You know, I've heard of InventTech before, and I'll tell you all this. Make certain it's not just the old, we're going to introduce you to people. Shit, Ted and Steve, they can introduce you to people. And Mary Jo can introduce you to people. What I see from a lot of these guys is a, a whole lot of uh, a supposed pig and a poke, and you open it up, and it's a nasty tomcat with one eye. What I want you all to do, and you all can use that uh, various hillbilly scenario anytime you want. I'm giving you all full copyright to it. What I'm telling you all is this. If you go to these groups, I want you to kick their tires. I want you to haggle. I want you to negotiate. Hell, I want you to threaten and intimidate. Because if you're going to give good money to these folks, I want you to find out what they can do. But I'll tell you a little different story. Some of these SBDC folks you deal with have pretty damn good networks on their own. They've got the ability to reach out to colleagues anywhere to cover this stuff. You know what? I've got uh, colleagues I've introduced to the SBDC who help people build uh, prototypes, who help people bring things to market. So before you go to an invent tech whose bottom dollar is, I get your bottom dollar for doing minimal for you. If you're going to use these groups, y'all, kick their tires. I want to know success stories. I want you to call those people and find out what went on. If you feel that this person's a little too much like a sham wow guy, walk away. Because maybe they do have a couple of references. They'll tell you that invent tech's the greatest they've ever been. You know, maybe they're a great company and they're really good at getting it um, landed for you. If that's the case, I salute you, go with it, but you do not, do not enter into anything until you've kicked those tires, come back to Ted or Steve, Mary Jo, whomever, and ask questions about, hey, I'm working with these guys, what have you heard? You know, do you know anybody who's dealt with them? Do we have a success story? Because again, much like LegalZoom, you know, you go to them and they'll do certain things for you. But essentially, a lot of these invention disclosure groups will come back and be like, hey, Here's what we promise. We're going to put you on a radio. We're going to take your stuff to a, a um, convention someplace. We're going to show it. We're going to introduce it to 100 people. Well, if these 100 people can't help you do a thing, then what's it useful? So understand, guys, they may promise everything. Kick their tires in a vicious way. Uh, this is your money. You have to take care of it as a small business because nobody else would. But great question, guys. Uh, again, not a fan of going to those folks. And if you go to one that nobody likes or has very bad stories about, don't use them. If it's one that people seem to have a neutral on or good, kick their tires. Find out what they do. Find out if what they do is right for you. Because one size does not necessarily fit all. So I put a, I put a link in the chat regarding InventTech. Uh, so if people want to check that, that particular thing out. so Absolutely, guys. And if you're going to use them, make and again, writing, writing, writing. They're going to send you a writing and tell you to sign it. Au contraire. Chad, do we sign that? Chad. Sure off. Sorry, cooking. Um, <laughs> tell me again. But now, Chad, if we go to InventTech and they give us a contract, are we just going to sign what they gave us? No. No, we're not. Thank you, Mr. Sure off. What are you cooking, by the way? Uh, tortellini Alfredo. Nice. Everybody, dinner at Chad's house here in about half an hour. Now, <laughs> thank you, Chad. But guys, haggle, negotiate, bargain. We're going to do this. Ted, Steve, Mary Jo, sign me up for our next one. We're going to go over this, guys. Do not be afraid to go to these folks and be like, nope, you're saying you're going to do X. Heck no, you're going to do Y. And you're saying, I'm going to pay you Z. No, 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 no. I'm paying you A. Haggle, negotiate, bargain, threaten, intimidate, lead. Y'all got the ultimate choice here, guys. You don't have to use anybody for anything. But if you choose to, you make certain that it's a favorable situation for your business, not for them. If they make money, that's great, but we want it to take care of you. I right, guys, trade secrets. They're secret. That's the biggest thing about them. They're secret recipes, man. We don't tell the janitor the trade secrets. We don't tell the marketing person the trade secrets. 
The only thing we do is if we have an NDA to somebody, we might tell them the trade secret pertinent to that situation. We may have covenants not to compete with our employees, so they can't go use our trade secrets somewhere else. Um, our confidential information, they're going to be posted, guys. Even if you're a three-person shop, you need to have a handbook that'll say, hey, I'm teaching you things. You're getting exposed to the secret recipe, the way we do things, the way our marketing expansion plans work, things that our competitors or you, if you wanted to become a competitor, could use against us. So what I want y'all to do is take reasonable steps. Reasonable guys is in quotes, court word, and it's going to be the same in the islands. It is in South CAC, as in Texas, as in New York, as in Cali. The judge is going to say, what did you, Mr. Business Owner, do to protect those trade secrets? Lock doors. And I do mean that. If you have an area where your stuff is, have a lock on the door. You know, password access on your computer. Not everybody needs access to everything. Third-party access. Y'all, I had a client. I'm, I wish I could say I make these war stories up, but they're all too horrible to actually be false. I had a client literally walk through a company that runs the Apple through their entire facility with camera phones answering questions because they were flattered that Apple, sorry, Rhymes with Apple, wanted to come and tour their facility. Bizarrely enough, Apple, or sounds like Apple, filed a patent that was extremely similar to their process that they showed them, but they followed it under a non-publication notice so you didn't see it until the damn thing had been allowed by the patent office. And that's another way to really make it a submarine. You can't file foreign on those, but they were just interested in the states. Now, Ted could guess what kind of language I used with the client when they explained what happened. Because they called and said, hey, you will not believe this patent that came out. And I looked at it and I went up and actually visited the client. They're close, walked through the facility, and I'm like, Holy snot. And luckily, you know, there are some homegrown territory rights. If you've been doing something before a patent comes out, you don't want to rely upon those. You would rather keep it a trade secret and not walk the Apple guys through with their cell phones. But I sat down with the, uh, the company, the board, the owner, and all the big people. And I'm like, why the hell did we do this? And again, y'all, I get it. We're a small business. Great big 800-pound gorilla rolls in and says, you're so pretty. You're so cool. Show me your stuff. Heck no, unless there's an NDA, no. And we definitely don't walk them through the product, uh, production facility and let them take pictures. And guys, I'll tell you all this because everybody's a small business right now. You probably, some of you are going to get bigger. We do not want to give away our trade secrets. It is just a horrible plan. It has no benefit to anybody and a lot of harm to you. Um, label it. If it's confidential or trade secret, stamp it on there. Get you one of those cool little red stamps. Put it on there. Keep it in the file behind a locked door. And again, the no plant tours with cameras and AV, I'm telling you that because it freaking happens with a client of mine. They're not dumb people. They're very intelligent people. They make good money, but damned if they weren't easily shined on. And sure enough, they give the walking tour. And then 22 months later, here's this horrible little patent hanging out there. Uh, questions. I keep seeing some flashing lights, but I'm kind of like a T-Rex and we're drawing the movement. Cool. And guys, I realize we're going. Uh, we will keep y'all not much longer, I promise. But if y'all have questions, ask them. Um, again, failure to document. Just like our assignments, guys, we want to know who created this invention. We want to know where it came from, who did it, how they did it, yada, yada. But again, 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 my favorite word of the night, assignments, guys. Now, these are inventors. These aren't copyright artists. These are inventors. So, Omar, if you hired somebody to help you at the nonprofit and they came up with a new app for the uh, nonprofit that was just outlandishly successful. Really good, really sleek, well-designed. They're an inventor and you will want them to give you an assignment on all IP, not just patent, but copyright, trademark, whatever else might be involved. We want them to assign that to you guys. Because guess what? If they're not an employee doing employee duties for you, they're an independent contractor. And if they don't do this, if they don't assign those patent rights, guys, they own the patent. Here's the worst problem. If you don't put them on the patent as an inventor, which they are, and it issues from the patent office, it can be void ab initio, meaning it's no good. That all that money, all that time, all that effort that you spent has been eradicated. And because you probably, during the term of that patent, were now using the device, selling the device, making YouTube videos about it, you've probably become your own prior art. So guys, again, be very careful. We don't disclose anything. And we make certain that we get assignments from our copyright artists as well as our inventors. 
again, wait until we get the money. Well, again, you know, free can be very expensive. My guy with the gutters waited until he had the money, but by then he was his own worst enemy. We couldn't get a patent on something he created because he made it publicly available. By uh, going cheap, and again, everybody will say, hey, LegalZoom will do a patent for $2,000. Mm, kind of like Steve said, free is sometimes expensive and cheap is too. Be careful. You want a patent that's got reverse claims to it. You want a patent to where you had a chance to touch it a few times, to ask questions of the attorney, to be able to say, I don't get this paragraph. What do you mean? You want that kind of rapport. You're not going to get that kind of rapport with LegalZoom or somebody. Go to an attorney. I've got a state bar that hangs a guillotine over my head. If I'm a doofus, if I do something stupid or inappropriate or wrong, you've got the ability to raise teetotal hell on me, which is awesome. But LegalZoom, you're using some attorney who's in some office who won't be at these guys in six months. Be very, very careful of that relationship. Because remember, I said patents are long and they're expensive. And if that guy working with you is supposedly going to be gone in just a few months, that's a bad plan to start with. Patent deadlines, just like I said before, they're unforgiving. You can buy extensions for some stuff, but typically you've got six months to respond. If you miss that six-month date, boom, patent dead. Uh, so I, 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 I feel like I have to uh, throw in a little uh, public service announcement here Do for it. FBDC. So I, I will just make sure that everybody on this call knows it. Anytime a business owner, entrepreneur comes in and walks into an office, an SBDC office, meets with anybody from the SBDC staff or contractor, we are bound by not to not share your information with anybody. There's absolutely zero information is shared. I know that's a question that we get a lot. Um, you know, who's going to see my information? No one outside the Small Business Development Center um, will see your information. So um, I, we've actually had a couple of clients ask us to sign NDAs, um, which is fine, but uh, we're all bound by the same confidentiality, confidentiality um, agreement that an NDA is, uh, particularly because we're utilizing federal funding as a source and local funds as well. So um, you don't have to worry about meeting with an SBDC um, employee because we'll make sure that uh, your information is not shared outside of uh, our offices. I'll tell you what, guys, I hope you paid attention to that because it's one thing I love about the SBDC. And remember, I'm biased. I'm on the state board for the one in South Carolina. The SBDC is one of the best organizations a small business will ever meet. I'm going to say it slow. The SBDC is one of the best organizations an entrepreneur or a small business can ever encounter. They're awesome. Use them. They're free. They're fairly funded. Just like Ted said, they don't go telling secrets. They are just like me. We have attorney-client privilege. They've got a privilege that's set up through the feds. They'll give you non-disclosure if you ask. It's cool. They will work with you. They're free, and they help you do good stuff. I can't pitch them enough, guys. Um, back to the uh, secrets. What could it be? It can be pricing. It could be material sources. Where do you get it from? Maybe it's cheaper from <clears throat> this part of the island and that part of the island. What are our expansion plans? Where are we going next? Where are our competitors at? Where are they going? How are we going to market this new widget? You know, what are, what are we going to do to get this trademark to take off? Recipes, formulations, guys. Chemistry is almost always a trade secret. It is very hard to duplicate. Think Coca-Cola, think KFC. Um, a cool one was Bush's Baked Beans. Do you guys remember the commercials about that obnoxious hound dog? Going to pop a lot of balloons. There was never a secret. It was freaking beans and brown sugar. That's really how they sold a lot of beans. But due to getting the idea that there was a trade secret, they grew to 80% of the baked bean market at their max sales volume, guys based on a fake trade secret. So understand, you guys with the real trade secrets, you've got it going on, but you can also give that aura of mystique that will make people come to you because they think, oh my God, these guys have got a trade secret. These guys know something nobody else does. And you do, you just have to be careful to protect it. Um, written documents, guys, one thing I never want y'all to do, and this is in red for a reason, ever, never, so help me by all the powers in the universe, ever, put a time limit on trade secrets. Trade secrets can last infinitely from now to when the universe is a dust cloud if you keep them protected. If you take those reasonable steps we talked about, locked doors, limited access, passwords, etc., you can keep a trade secret available forever to protect your company and help it benefit. But if you put in a contract and it expires in 30 days, it literally expires in 30 days. 
<clears throat> the person you signed that with can go use it. Don't ever do that. What's the worst that can happen? Guess what? If it's an invention and you didn't have an assignment from it, you don't protect it. You know, if you're hoping, hey, I'm going to tell people about this and they're going to buy it, you might be destroying your patent rights. Uh, you didn't own it. Again, you know, I might have said assignments 250 times tonight. I should probably say 2,000 times more. This happens so much, it's ridiculous. Um, somebody beat you. Guys, the U.S. system for both trademarks and patents is first to file. Whoever gets a foot in the door first wins that race. This is no Roadrunner Wiley Coyote where we can drop anvils on each other. If one of them gets a foot through the door before you, they win, you lose. It's that simple. I uh, guess what? If we're going to try to go get venture capital, if we're going to try to get somebody to give us grants, we're going to try to get seed money, they're going to ask about this. You will have a male or female version of me saying, hey, tell me how you protected this. Tell me about your patents. Tell me about your trademarks. Tell me about your trade secrets. What copyrights do you have registered? How do you protect these things? That's coming out. They're going to want to know this. That's also why I want you all to be very careful about disclosing it to these parties. We do not want to shoot ourselves in the foot by accident. And again, do not agree that trade secrets expire. They don't. And a lot of people will confuse a trade secret with confidential information. Apple and an orange, watermelon and a grape. Absolutely different. A trade secret is not confidential information. If you have any document that says, hey, confidential information includes trade secrets and they all are going to only be protected for five years, don't sign it. Haggle, negotiate, intimidate, threaten, leave. Do whatever you need to do, but you make that document either work for you or you don't sign it. Because if something is going to impact your trade secrets by making them public information, it's a warrant to a trade secret. We can't let that happen. Other basics, guys, corporate entity. Got to have one set up. If y'all don't, contact somebody at the SBDC, contact somebody at your local chamber, contact somebody at one of your uh, local business entities. You know, here we've got the uh, Secretary of State. That's who handles them all here. Find out who your entity is for that. Have it done. We don't want anybody being personal liable. We just don't want that to happen. Uh, we want that corporate corporate entity to also own all the IP, period. Going to make a succession plan easier. You sell it to somebody, hey, it's already owned by the entity. I just have to sell you the entity. We're good. Corporate veil, meaning that if somebody tries to come at you personally, you have a corporate shield in front of you. They have to show that the corporate shield is violated in order to get to you personally. It's very hard to do that. Again, Financing venture, they love giving money to LLCs much more than they do to the Chad Judd show, you know, the Daryl Mack show, the Celia Dan show. Uh, sophistication, guys, one thing when we're talking to people who are wanting to give us money, we want them to know that we're sophisticated, that we're going to protect that money, and we're not going to go to Vegas and boil it. They want to know that, hey, these guys have got their business in order. They've been to the SDC. They talked to Ted. They talked to Steve. They talked to Mary Jo. They understand this. They've got a marketing plan. They've got goals but they also thought about protecting that IP. They also have set up a corporate entity. They also have their ducks in a row. Because guys, that initial shine on, you know, it's all about how to negotiate, bargain, intimidate, threat, and leave. You know, you're somewhere on those spectrums at all times. You want to make certain you're doing it from a point of power. And if you're doing that with your IP short up, with an LLC in place, and with the knowledge base of the SDBC backing you, you've got a good head start. Uh, patent versus trade secret. If you can reverse engineer it, file a patent on it. I don't care how simple or complex it is. If we can take it apart, and we were uh, talking about the Chinese earlier, they love to do it. You tell them to build something like we will, and the plant across the street's building it too because they took it apart. If it can be reverse engineered, you want a patent. A patent can prevent those uh, counterfeits from coming into the U.S. Can't even be imported. They don't have to sell them here. They don't have to advertise them here. They can't even get them through the border because if you got a patent, you can stop it. Um, if it's difficult to replicate, like chemicals, Coca-Cola, KFC, Bush's baked beans and their fake bean trade secret, chemical stuff is hard to replicate. Might be better to keep that as a trade secret. Um, I've got a client down in Charleston that makes alcohol-infused ice cream. They've been my client since 20, oh, 2008. And I have no idea how the ice cream's made. No idea. And I filed trademarks for them. I've helped them negotiate buys. I've helped them look at get venture capital. I know nothing about that ice cream, and I don't want to because it's a trade secret, and they're going to keep it that way forever because it's really hard to duplicate it. Uh, you're having to convince alcohol and ice cream to live together. Pretty much don't like doing that. They found a way to make it happen. Again, patents are slow, and they're expensive, guys. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get a utility patent in six months. You might get a design patent. 
You know, when we were talking about that device that I held up that covers the look of it, you can get one of those in six to nine months, but a utility on how something works, you're probably 18 months from the utility being filed before you even touch a examiner for a first office action. Again, specialize, do it correctly. I know LegalZoom will tell you to file one. I see LegalZoom patents all the time. I really wish I didn't because they do the utmost bare minimum. You want a well fleshed out patent. You want to have several discussions with your attorney on what's in it, how it works, why it says this. If you don't do that, you're just hurting yourselves. Uh, trade secret protection, guys, should have been in place three days ago. Locked doors, passwords, need to know access, not telling third parties, making certain that we create this aura of mystique about our stuff that makes us uh, successful and makes us money. Yay. That's it, guys. Question time. This may not be a question for you, but uh, since we are in the community of the Virgin Islands here, um, anybody know a good attorney for this? <laughs> and I am insulted on all levels. Uh, <laughs> one, one thing I will tell you now, and, and sure, I'll make certain that I send you that check I promised you earlier. Um, a federally, guys, the cool thing about patents, trademarks, copyrights, they're federal. Anybody in the islands is protected exactly the same as anybody in South Cacti, Texas, Carolina. If an attorney is able to do it like I am, we can do it for you regardless. So it is great because it's a federal protection. There may also be Virgin Islands like state trademarks, um, state and trade secret laws, et cetera. You're not really interested in those. You guys are interested in federal protection, federal trademarks, federal patents, any federal prosecutor, my bar number 7271, any federally um, admitted attorney can do this for you. So don't feel because we're in the islands we can't get help. You can have somebody in freaking Nova Scotia, well, no, it's Canada. You can have somebody in Nebraska do it for you, which is about as central land as you can get. So don't feel that because you guys are in the islands that you're limited from using anybody in the States. You're absolutely not. Fantastic. Send me your card. I'll do, well, actually, these guys will send you an email. It's even easier than that. Wonderful. Thank you. You're That's welcome, Chad. Next questions, guys. Hey, Y'all have asked great questions tonight. Don't let it end here. I realize you guys are probably tired, but ask all the questions. You've got me here as long as you need me. Um, the do's and don'ts of trademarks, you guys want us to download that to our computer because it's saying we don't have permission. Oops. Um, Chad, I sent it out as a PDF. Um, okay. They don't have permission? Okay. Yeah, when it, when I try to save it to my computer, it says um, you don't have permission to save in this location. Contact the administrator to obtain permission. Oh, that that's probably is that a work computer? Um, yeah, mine, mine is too, Ted. I just got the exact same thing as George. Yeah. yeah, that that's probably why it's a work computer. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll fix it and get it back out to you. All right. Thank you. I did post uh, the Lieutenant Governor's office uh, in the, the uh, chat as well, their website, so. Awesome, thank you for that, Ted. I'm actually Thanks. clicking on that too to see where it goes. I use the South Carolina Secretary of State one all the time, but guys, this is a good way to check for business names. It's a good way to get your LLC set up. There's a lot of good things you can do. Don't get your hopes up too high comparing uh, the Secretary of State of South Carolina with uh, our lieutenant governor's office. It's it's yeah. uh, they're in the process of updating their websites. Uh, Ted, you heard I'm from South Carolina, baby. We're the worst of the worst of the worst, according to everybody else. <laughs> oh, hold my beer, Doug. We'll uh, we'll have a discussion later. All right, I love beer discussions. They're the best, and you know, very yeah, but we're 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 definitely working hard on behalf of small businesses to make doing business in the Virgin Islands uh, much easier uh, and much uh, more smooth to start a business and to do business. So um, those are some of the things that we're doing down here, so. Awesome. And guys, please do take advantage of Ted, of Steve, Mary, everybody, because if you don't, it's just silly. I mean, they're a great organization. They help so many people. And I've been involved with it. I guess I've been a member of the SBDC, either on the Green Bull or state board now, stretching back to like 2007, guys. It is an awesome group. I mean, it really helps a lot of people do a lot of good things. And it helps a lot of businesses learn stuff. I mean, hey, that's why we're here tonight is to learn. The SBDC is a free, great resource for you to learn how to make the business better. 
Guys, any other questions? I know how to bored y'all to tears, and I understand. Hey, Doug, Doug, your um, hey, your contact information is 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 on is in here. Um, Did I you give us your so. contact information? All right, here I can give it to you right now. I'll just hit you with my email. You guys hit it. This is my religious work email. Check all the time. I'm making sure I spell my name right. It's been a long day. Boom. Right there it is, Daryl. You guys feel free to reach out if I can help you with anything. And again, me being in the States, y'all being in the islands doesn't matter. We're looking at federal protection. And it's all under the same umbrella. Before we sign off, can I say a couple of words? Um, Doug, I think we first met, although you may not, I think you might remember it probably three, three and a half years ago. Uh, you gave a presentation to our group in Hilton Head. Yep, I remember Hilton Head quite well. You, you had some of those score bombs hanging in there. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I saw where you were going to be there on Thursday speaking at the chamber. Literally. Anyway, I think actually it was Daryl, I believe, who had a, um, a client who had an intellectual property issue. And that's when I talked with Daryl and talked with Ted in the hope that we could arrange this. Um, I hope everybody's found it useful. Um, interesting <laughs> and uh, and you learn something. Uh, I mean, I learn something every time I hear Doug talk. So that's uh, uh, for somebody who thinks they know a lot, that's saying something. But now, Steve, you guys let me know that I'm serious about doing the negotiating one. Y'all let me know when you'd like to do that. I think there's a cool book, so my phone is on. Super. Was that you, Karen Jones? But y'all, holler when you need me. I'm always yeah. here. You've got my email. Reach out to me. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Now, we'll make sure to coordinate some additional uh, um, trainings with you, with you, Doug. Absolutely. So just so like that, say it always here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, uh, Doug put his email uh, in, the converse, in the chat as well. Um, feel free to reach out directly to Doug or reach out to the SBDC and we can connect you as well. We plan to do some more presentations uh, with Doug now and his invitation. We're gonna put up this uh, training webinar on our YouTube page. So please visit us, um, YouTube VISBDC. Uh, follow us on our social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all at VISBDC. And uh, we look forward to a continued collaboration with great partners like SCORE, Doug and other professionals uh, in our territory and throughout uh, the U.S. So um, thank you so much, Doug. Any any last words? Uh, haggle, negotiate, bargain, threaten, intimidate, guys. It's your business. Nobody's going to do this for you. This is all about you guys taking advantage of the SBDC and the protections that are out there to make your business take off. Sounds good. We appreciate your time. And uh, Mary Jo, any last words? Uh, anything we need to know that's coming up with SBDC trainings? Well, in terms of training, well, in terms of training, I want to thank Doug Lineberry for a fabulous presentation this evening. I learned, golly, <laughs> I learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody else did too. So we want to thank you for your presentation, Doug. Now, Not coming up, you're always welcome. Thank you, thank you, and we will definitely be reaching out for these other presentations you've offered to do. So, you guys in the audience can look out for those. Now, coming up on Thursday, we have um, a part of the training series with the Virgin Islands Economic Development Authority, and we're going to cover their loan programs and the state business incentive program. So if anybody's looking for funding, that's an, a good opportunity. It's part of our Lunch and Learn series that's going to be every Thursday through August the 19th from noon until 1.30. Um, next, this coming Thursday is the one on loans. We have one on the small business uh, program so you can get EDC benefits, how you can be an EDC supplier. So definitely tune in, sign up on Facebook, sign up on our website. It's information you'll be glad to have. And it'll some of it will dovetail real nicely into some of the stuff that uh, Doug has talked about this evening. So on behalf of the SBDC, our state director, Mr. Ted Gutierrez, um, we want to thank you all for joining us this evening, and we'll see you on Thursday. Pretty work, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, everybody.
All right.